Good afternoon everybody, welcome to Safari Live and our afternoon safari here at Wild Earth TV. Uh, we've started the afternoon with some leopard tracks. My name is Ben and I'm going to be taking you out this afternoon and on camera I've got Mpo behind the lens. There we go. Um, we're on Voitella Access at the moment. Um, on the way back from drive, Cedric spotted some very fresh male leopard tracks uh, that were coming Looked like they come all the way up through Zoe's, out onto uh, the Access Road, and then have gone down towards Impala Road. So we've just come out to have a look at where those last tracks are, uh, which hopefully you guys can see here on the camera. We've got the front foot and the back foot. They're walking in this direction, so they might be a little bit harder to, to see on the camera. Uh, but this is a big male leopard track. Could be Moati perhaps, or maybe even Tortoise Pan or Tlabungumi out here in the west. Uh, looks like a territorial male though, the way we've been able to follow the tracks sort of in off the side of the road, uh, probably where he was scent marking, and then back onto the road and marching up here. Shame we missed him walking down the middle of the road. They were on top of everybody's vehicle tracks after the drive uh, this morning, so just wrong place, wrong time. But we are going to focus our search this afternoon in and around uh, Impala Road and Power Lines and see if maybe we can find this big boy. Obviously, if it is Moati, we might struggle because he is a little bit temperamental, but uh, we won't know unless we try. Uh, just to give you an idea, if you want to have a look at the tracks, uh, it might be quite difficult to, to see actually on the screen, but we've got some big male leopard tracks here, and we can see that very characteristic three lobes at the back of the pad, which you can maybe be able to see here in the back. Uh, but this is, a, this is a big animal. This is not a small leopard, certainly a big territorial male. And actually measured his body length a little bit earlier, which we can do by measuring from the same track to the same track again. So this is uh, this leopard's front right foot here. And if I take a measurement from his front right foot, bypass his left foot, and then back to his uh, right foot, we end up here. So this distance to this distance, uh, which is probably a good meter, maybe a little bit more. That is this leopard's body uh, size from shoulders to pelvis. So that gives us a good indication, and with males being so much bigger than females, uh, even if we weren't sure by looking at the size of the tracks, this is definitely a male just from the body size, and a big male at that. And he does have very large feet. So yeah, we're going to focus our efforts in this area, going to check in Parlour Road. If I don't find anything coming out there, it's possible he's just in this block somewhere off to my left, uh, your right, because it's very hot this afternoon. Uh, and I'm, we're hoping that he hasn't gone far, considering these tracks were made probably somewhere between sort of eight and half past nine this morning. So we will, only one way to find out, and that is to go and have a look. Just want to make sure he didn't walk down this game path. We're just trying to see where he came off this road, but I don't see any evidence here. So he came off the road somewhere into this area, but Impala Drive is just over the other side here, so that'll be the next place to check. Of course, if you've got uh, any questions or comments, uh, please, please, please do send them in to us. You could do that by going to our website, wildearth.tv forward slash questions. Um, register on the website and you can send us any and all questions you might have and we will as always do our very best to answer them. There is a great proverb that has been passed down from generation to generation across the plains of Africa. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Join Wild Earth for a special lion safari on the 10th of August, broadcast to you live in celebration of World Lion Day. Witness the pride and joy of Juma, the Nkumas, the Talamatis, and the Avoka males who come roaring to your screens to tell you their story. Here on Wild Earth, we love it when you interact with our guides while they are live. In order to do this, you must head over to wildearth.tv forward slash questions and submit your questions, comments and suggestions. Simple as that. And to make it even simpler, from time to time you will see a QR code on your screen. Open your camera phone and scan this code and it will take you straight to where you need to be. We look forward to answering your questions on this channel.
Okay, if we're just arriving up at Impala clearings now, or sort of the area around Sandy Patch. So there is a road that runs sort of back on a bit of an angle from where we've just come from. So we're going to look back down there towards power lines and see if there's any tracks coming out. So it's going to be quite slow, this process. Obviously, it's a lot easier if you have a tracker working with you. A lot of the private lodges uh, in South Africa, of course, we have the tracker who sits up on the front and those guys, their eyes are incredible. They'll see a track whilst you're driving at sort of 20 odd kilometers now. Oh, we're going to have a bit of traffic. If you just saw the Impala fly over the road, not being chased by a leopard, unfortunately, actually being chased by a, another male Impala. Now she's just been ousted and she looks as if he just chased her off because the male's gone back from where whence he came. Dangerous girlies, be out on your own, there's a leopard somewhere. But interesting to see that some of the Impalas are still rutting. Uh, so most likely this is a younger male who wasn't successful in establishing a territory during the, the peak rutting season, which is sort of April to end of May. Of course, we're now in August, but you do get a late rut as well. And some of these subordinate males may have an opportunity to mate if one of the females didn't fall pregnant during the original rut. And that's one of the, the reasons we do get some slightly later births of Impala. And that's sort of one of the explanations of this myth that impalas can hold their birth, uh, which is unfortunately not the case. Yeah, I see she's also going for shade. If there is a leopard in this area, he's going to be lying under the shade. So I think unless he's next to the road, we're going to have to get out on foot and uh, go and try and see if we can find him lying under a bush, I would think. But yeah, not a good place to be on your own, Impala. Of course, the majority of these Impalas should be pregnant now from after the rutting season. And uh, they say statistically that about 98% of all Impala ewes do fall pregnant during the rutting season. They have a very good strike rate, which is, I see our males chasing a few more around to our left. Um, that's one of the many reasons that impalas are so successful. Uh, and they do say that left unchecked, if we didn't have a healthy predator population to um, control the impala population, the impala population would increase by about 40% every year. Hmm, seems that the male has now corralled the rest of his herd and is sort of bringing them back in her direction now. Interesting, just goes to show that the animals don't always read the books. And it has been a strange year, we keep mentioning it. It has been pretty cold, it's now rather warm, it has to be said, for a winter's afternoon. Uh, Hannah, yes, let's hope we can continue what was a very good start to Saturday Catterday, indeed. We're just missing a, a spotted one. Well, a, a le we've missing a leopard. We had two cheetahs this morning. I suppose we can't really complain with that. So here's the rest of the group. The, the male went back and he's herded all these females back together again and sort of shoved them up into this direction. But we've heard no alarm calls or anything from the area. Uh, when I did see impalas bolting around, of course, you, you think, oh, why are they running? Uh, but we didn't hear any alarm calls. It was purely the male still doing that sort of roar and snorts that they make. Uh, when they are keeping their harem of females together. Very nice. And now they all disappear. All right, let's take a slow drive down Impala. And then we would expect those leopard tracks, if he carried on in a sort of a straight line, to pop out somewhere on this road. So we're going to drive very slowly. Try not to miss it. Like I was saying, ideally, if you've got a tracker on the front, I mean, his, not only his eyes and his ability to interpret these little scuffs in the sand far greater than most of us, uh, but they also don't have to worry about uh, driving as well and not crashing at the same time. So you'll excuse me if I do go quiet. I'm staring rather intently at the floor, looking for some evidence. It's fine if they're walking down the road, <clears throat> because then they leave quite an obvious 
excuse me, an obvious uh, trail to follow, but if they've just crossed the road, you can blink once and miss it. And that's, of course, assuming that they have crossed on a nice sandy stretch of road, which this is. If they've crossed where the ground is very dry, uh, then it can be a lot more difficult to see anything, because if they haven't, if the soil is not loose enough for them to have left an impression on the soil, then, of course, we would not know. of impala tracks along the road here. Quite a few hyena tracks from last night, some zebra tracks. I actually had zebra on this road yesterday afternoon, which is really nice to see some of the zebra back again. It's not an area known for its zebra and wildebeest, but this area up uh, around Sandy Patch with its nice short grass after the fire a few months ago has attracted some grazing animals, which is always nice to see. Nothing crossing the road as of yet. We'll get down to power lines, which is another few hundred meters, and we'll have a good look there. That will be the next option. Interestingly, if that leopard was scent marking, I didn't get any whiff of that classical popcorn smell on the road, but it did look as if he came off the road and back on, back into the bushes uh, once or twice. But I think had he have done that, we should have smelt that very pungent scent and it should still be hanging in the air. Which could mean that it's a young leopard. I was chatting to Cedric about it earlier and he suggested that maybe Sasha was exploring. Um, Lillian, I think it was Lillian, I hope so. Um, an Impala's main predator. Well, the predator that takes the most Impala statistically is the wild dog. Uh, wild dogs love impalas, they're one of the major controlling factors of impala population numbers because they have such incredible appetites and really, really fast metabolism, so they have to eat quite a lot of impalas, unfortunately for them. Uh, probably next in terms of percentage of its successful kills would be cheetah, and then followed by leopard and then lion at the bottom, because don't forget for a lion an impala is nothing more than a, a little snack, especially if there's a pride of them together. Uh, but yeah, wild dogs, very, very successful. If you could imagine a decent sized pack, if you're talking sort of, you know, 15 dogs plus, uh, which is not unusual, uh, then they could potentially be eating two or three impalas a day. And if you convert that into a year, you know, you're losing a thousand impala a year just to one pack of wild dogs. So they can have quite an important um, effect on the population numbers. And the other thing that these predators do, of course, as well, is sort of split up these herds. They chase them everywhere, particularly the dogs. These impala herds split up, and then when the members do find another group, they sort of migrate into different groups, and that's a good way of sharing out the genetics. So it's not all a negative thing. Uh, sometimes these animals, even though it sounds quite brutal because it's all about hunting, they're actually, in the long run, helping the species. Right, I'm just going to have a quick look here at the junction with Power Lunge. You're welcome to come along with me. Just seeing if there's any tracks coming out. Got some old hyena tracks. The good thing is, I suppose, if we don't find any tracks coming out here, then we can make an assumption that perhaps he is still somewhere in this block. And then maybe I'll go for a little walk and see if we can find anything in there. You might notice that I'm sort of walking almost sideways on and often looking back towards you. That's because the sun is up here over Mpo's left shoulder there. And it's much easier to see those tracks when you're looking into the sun rather than against it. You just see the, the shadows a little bit better. What's that? 
Uh, just tying in the tracks all look like from last night. Uh, but we're going to patrol this road up and down, just make absolutely sure. Of course, it could have crossed anywhere. Otherwise, we will go back up to Voyager Access and uh, go back to those tracks, try and find exactly where they went into the block, and then I'll see if I can follow them through the block itself. Okay, while we figure out, or try and figure out where this leopard went, I'm going to send you over to Andrew so he can say good afternoon. My name is Andrew, and indeed I'm going to be controlling the dam cameras here. As uh, Rolf used to say, I'm on waterhole watch this afternoon. And so fairly quiet up until now, except for some beautiful giraffe that have decided to come down. Indeed looks uh, like a very nice and warm day out in Mashatu. It's about 28 degrees Celsius out there, uh, which is actually a fantastic day given that it is winter and it's a winter month. So the animals are definitely embracing it, soaking up the sun and making the most. Oh, there's the crocodile. You see the crocodile? The bottom of the screen there, swimming towards us. Interesting. What I think has happened now is the crocodile went to go and uh, investigate the giraffe. And uh, realized that, uh, no, no, this is a bit too hectic or heavy of a sighting. Uh, or, or, or a catch, rather decided to, to rather come back. But you can actually see the silt trail uh, that the crocodiles left behind while it was swimming off. Beautiful, eh? Hey? The Masai Mara is back and the first Wild Earth expedition is underway. Join our expeditioners on the 6th of August as they chat around the fire after a week in the Masai Mara. Along with our Kenyan hosts, David and Isaac, they will discuss the best moments from the expedition open to all Wild Earth viewers who have registered for free on our website. Scan the QR code to find out more. We want to make it even easier for you to interact with our guides whilst watching Wild Earth. When you see a QR code like this pop up on your screen, then open your phone camera, point it at the code and you will be taken directly to our question page. Simple as that. Then you can let us know what you want to see, ask questions, and much more. Well, I've had it before where I've been walking and a water bucks jumped out of the grass. It's quite a frightening experience. Wild Earth. It's in your Look at that. Just a few ox peckers on the leg of the giraffe that's looking away now. I don't know if you can see the legs of this giraffe that's walking. Okay, she's stopped now. But they definitely walk in a unique way. So front and back on the same side of the body will walk in synchronization together. And then the other side in synchronization with each other. Oh, she wants to drink some more. But very cautious. The giraffe is actually looking at that crocodile right now. And folks, you can't comprehend the eyesight of giraffe. Uh, they've got incredible eyesight. I remember in 2010 in the Timbavati, we were watching a giraffe staring away at something. And my tracker said to me, let's go and investigate that. Let's go and actually see what this giraffe is seeing. And we investigated and we found an African wildcat busy walking in the grass. And the giraffe was literally staring at us. I don't know how the giraffe saw it, but uh, but they did. There we go. Good old drink. Very relaxed animals, aren't they? So you'll often hear the naturalists talking about, you know, various... Excuse me. <clears throat> um, you often hear uh, naturalists talk about various following mechanisms that animals have so they can stay in touch with each other and they can see one another in a group. 
So if you look at the, the ears of the giraffe, uh, they are white, 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 and that uh, will play that purpose that each and every giraffe will hopefully be able to see one another when feeding over a big, large, large distance. But yeah, let's uh, send you over to Chris. I know he's eager to introduce himself. Hi there, everybody. Very nice and warm afternoon here at Brightlands. I'm just driving around a bit. I was going to stop there at Leopard Dam just to see if there's something that comes and brings. And we heard some elephants that sounded like they're approaching Leopard Dam. Leopard Dam is right up ahead. So we're going to check if they're not perhaps there yet. In fact, they are. There we go. Right, my name's Chris, with me, Kamat, BK Uhuru, and we have elephants. Right, let's go take a look. I can only see one at the moment. We'll stop in a moment. We'll stop in a moment. We'll stop in a moment. Because we were literally just parked there to do our intro, and then uh, we heard the elephants, and we started moving. So I think let's quickly see if we can get a gap through here somewhere. It's right over here. You can see it. Alright, looks like just one bull, eh? Here's a spot. Oh, no. There's my hip. All right, Terby, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there, but that's fine. We can all just enjoy this waterhole again. Look at these giraffe. It's just amazing. They are so visually aware of what's going on around them. I just always respect that about giraffe. Very wise animals. If something's happening in the bush, usually giraffe, they know about it somehow. But yeah, I'm just going to try and pan down here, see if we can't scout for this crocodile. I don't know where he went. Okay, so here he is just over here. Wow, look at that, eh? Wow. Okay, let me try and just go ahead here because I see he's moving there. It's quite a trick to anticipate where you need to place the camera in order to, to catch the animal again in view. Let's see how I do here. Come on. Almost. <laughs> oh, look at that terrapin right there by that crocodile. Yes, that's a close encounter, that. Of course, crocodiles pay no attention to terrapins whatsoever. Now, I don't know if you've experienced terrapins, folks. Uh, if you've ever come to Africa or gone on safaris, but uh, terrapin secretes a, a fluid when feeling disturbed uh, or threatened, secretes a fluid which smells incredibly bad. It tastes horrible for the animals. Uh, so predators, I have seen lions, you know, young lions trying to have a go at a terrapin. It doesn't last very long and they realize this animal is not a good idea to put in the mouth and they just spit it out and the terrapin will just crawl away. Yeah, if you get that uh, fluid on your clothes. If you do get that fluid on your clothes, it's uh, very, very, very bad. 
Uh, I know that in some situations you have to throw the, the clothes away. <laughs> but yeah, folks, I just want to punt on something uh, about the Masai Marin uh, fireside chat. Uh, so basically, uh, we, we're going to be holding our first fireside chat from the Masai Mara, which is going to be very interesting. Uh, that's going to happen on Saturday evening. So it's going to be at 7.30 p.m. in Central, also, uh, uh, Central African time. That'll be 8.30 in East African time. And they're going to be looking at the past week, uh, the highlight of all the sightings. And also you're going to meet some of the, the expedition guests who have been enjoying the migration and having a good time there. Uh, it'll be nice for you to, to definitely hear about that. Okay. That'll be the fireside chat. And of course the warthogs, and I think the crocodile did spot those warthogs, that's why it was swimming towards them. I mentioned a crocodile is not going to pay too much attention to a terrapin, but let me tell you now, a warthog for a crocodile is really a decent meal. Ellis, good afternoon. Thanks for your question there. Uh, I've never seen crocodile take down a giraffe. No, no, I've never seen that. Uh, it has been recorded, young young giraffe and things like that. But to be honest with you, Ellis, I've never seen crocodile take down anything, to be honest with you. Um, I have seen a crocodile when I was driving, uh, doing a game drive with my guest. My guest actually spotted it. So I said the crocodile's got something in his mouth. And I turned and I looked and it was a catfish. Um, so barbel, we call them, a catfish. Of course, the catfish was long gone it was was passed away but uh, was busy eating it yeah but i've never seen it live you'll have to be lucky because crocodiles are very patient very patient with a combination of being at the right time at the right place i've seen a few stalks in the water thought that the crocodile was going to catch something But uh, yeah, no, no, definitely. I wasn't patient enough to, to watch. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I believe Chris has got something awesome for you. So let's head back to Pridelands. Now, Elephant Bull has moved off, uh, but I'm sure we'll find him just now again. Now we're just looking at some terrapins, all just basking in the sun. Remember, they are cold blooded, so they are going to try and warm up a bit before it's dark. They are reliant on external factors to regulate their temperature. So if they want to warm up, they need to bask in the sun. If they want to cool down, they have to move to shade or back into the water. All right, I think let's see if we can't find that elephant bull again. It's a young bull. That's, he's literally just disappeared into the brush. I think let's go and see. After an exhilarating day of live safaris, what better than to cozy up around the fire? Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and let our guides enchant you with their stories and exciting animal encounters. And of course, stand a chance to join in the chat and get your questions answered in real time. So what are you waiting for? Join the Explorers Club today and start to enjoy our special evenings around the fire. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. to clean himself he's bossing to cool himself down
Right, this guy is much bathing. Oh, look at that. Oh, he's enjoying that so much. He's enjoying that so much. Oh, on a warm day like today, there is nothing more pleasant for an elephant to cover himself with that nice cool mud. You can see how he's enjoying it. Look. <laughs> Literally covering every single part of his body. I think he missed the spot on his base of his tail there, but you go. Well, that was really quite uh, entertaining, wasn't it? All right, he's heading into the thick bush there. I'm gonna bash after him. He's just one young elephant bull. They generally don't like if you get too close to them unless there's a group of them. So we're gonna continue to find a place where we can look around for some stuff on the ground, some bushwalky stuff. It's a bit of a hot afternoon. I'm not gonna do a lot of walking, but we'll definitely get a spot, look at the, a few things on the ground, do like a little loop like we said we're gonna do this morning. And hopefully we'll be able to find a few nice tracks perhaps the other thing is in winter as we head now further into the dry season when the dry season is not only winter the first bits of spring and early summer is still dry season right up to October sometimes November and in some severe cases even into December before we get rain so the further we go into the dry season, especially once we hit spring, sort of middle August, September, not a lot to interpret that the insects, there's a lot less insects, not all, no flowers, animals are still there, the migratory birds are not there yet, so it becomes a very tricky time for bushwalk from the sense of perspective of finding interesting little things. There's a lot more stuff out in summer. The advantage in those days, because there's a lot of dust around, tracking of animals become easier. The grass is shorter, you know, there's a lot more pathways created in the bush by things like elephant and hippo. And um, again, with all the dust around creating a layer, it's easier to see the tracks. So it's a give or take every season. Pros and cons. But for animal viewing, I think winter is better for dry season. Animals tend to congregate or visit water holes regularly. It's not that they stay at water holes, they still go out and eat. They use water much more often. Water becomes much more concentrated. There's fewer water holes around. Rivers dry up. The area just up ahead.
Okay, just an update on the lions from this morning. Uh, nobody's actually found them. They've crossed out of Pridelands. So the guys have been tracking them, tracking them all the way east, crossed into Boston, uh, Finger, Safari Lodges area. And that's outside of our signal area. We, it's no use going there. Uh, so we're going to bumble around a bit. Like I said, find some others. We're going to focus on whatever we can find today. But let's go over to Ben now, who's also driving around a bit. Everybody. Right, well you came at a good time actually because we've just done a whole loop around Impala, Power Lines, back up Triple M. Uh, I've just picked up tracks for a leopard crossing back over where it's access up towards Sandy Patch. So we're going to quickly head up there and see if we can find what's going on. There's a huge amount of hyena activity that's been in this area as well on top of our vehicle tracks from this morning which is also a little bit strange because it has been warm today and of course we were back at about half past nine. Uh, so whether those two are related, of course, is difficult to say. I mean, a leopard shouldn't attract the attention of lots and lots of hyenas. Uh, and I also went back to check where those buffalo we saw this morning at Baobab Dam, where they had crossed into Juma, uh, just to see whether or not perhaps there were some... Oh, we've got some dwarf mongoose over here. Uh, whether perhaps some lions had followed them in, but no evidence of any lion tracks yet. But we have found some little predators dwarf mongoose flitting around in front of us here. Let's have a, a quick appreciation of them and then I shall be hot on the heels of these leopard tracks. Hello little buddies. It's a good start. Africa's smallest predator as we search for its probably one of its most iconic. There's a remnant of an old termite mound there that they're probably just using for shelter, using all those tunnels I was mentioning this morning. Um, how much you know, good these termite mounds do, not only in terms of aerating the soil and putting nutrients back into the soil, uh, but also supplying perfect habitats for some of our smaller members of the environment. They are so cute, these things. Well, these are uh, uh, cooperative breeders, I suppose we could call them, where you've got one alpha male and alpha female. They're the only ones that produce any pups. So lots of other family members. It's certainly seen as a sign of importance if you can look after the alpha pair's little ones. So you'll actually get the other members fighting for the right to, to do some babysitting and teaching the youngsters how to hunt. Uh, they do some interesting things like millipedes, for example, is one of uh, a prey that they like to catch. And not many things eat millipedes because millipedes are poisonous. I don't know if anyone's ever picked up a millipede. Certainly the ones that we get out here, you end up with this sort of yellowy brown secretion uh, on your fingers that smells like iodine. It's got a very pungent smell and there's actually traces of hydrogen cyanide in there as well. So it's a wonderful chemical defense mechanism. It's a bit like alien. It actually produces this sort of yellow... Uh, acidic substance and what the mongoose will do is they'll catch them and then the millipede rolls up into a ball and then they kind of roll the millipede around in the ground forcing it to expel all of those chemicals in self-defense until it's sort of exhausted because it only has a finite amount so once it's used it it's going to take um, it, uh, biological power to replace it so there's not uh, an endless supply of it so yeah they they'll get rid of that secretion and then they can crack open the millipede and eat the insides. Civets as well are well known for enjoying a millipede or two. Uh, Ken is the actual size of a mongoose. To be honest, I'm going to check in the book to try and give you an a, a accurate thing. But I would say on me, I would say from snout to pelvis, you're probably looking just shorter than my forearm. Uh, obviously, that's going to very much depend on how 
long your thought item is. So let me just see precisely what the book says. Uh, weight, shoulder height, length, length of tail is about 15 centimetres total length, so I'm guessing that's including the tail, 35 to 40 centimetres, so maybe say call it 20 to 25 centimetres of body length minus the tail. So just shorter than a, than a standard ruler. That's obviously for an adult, but the little babies, sometimes you see them carrying around their babies in their mouth, uh, like a cat would do with its kittens, and those things are oh, probably only about six or seven centimetres long when you see they sometimes scamper across the road holding babies in their mouths if they're going to a new little bolt hole like this. Looks like we've got one sentry on top there keeping a lookout for any predators, something like a jackal or maybe even birds of prey, eagles and hawks and things would love to take a snake. A snake? A mongoose, sorry, I was also thinking, I was thinking about snakes when I said that. Of course we've got various other mongoose that we can see here. I saw a slender mongoose the other day, we've got banded mongoose in this area, white-tailed mongoose, and if we're really lucky there is something called a Mellor's mongoose and uh, where I live in Hoodsborough we actually caught one on the trap camera the other day. Um, a Miller's mongoose, for anyone who doesn't know, kind of looks like a white-tailed mongoose, but with a black bushy tail instead of uh, a white bushy tail. I've only ever seen, I think, two in the wild. But nice to know they're also in this sort of surrounding area. And there are many other mongoose species that don't occur in this particular area of South Africa. You've got a yellow mongoose over to the west, a large grey mongoose the Herpestidae family of which they are a part of is very diverse. All right, and Paul, I think let's carry on up Sandy Patch here. And yeah, I had those, those checks. The Vuitella access is just over here to my left and they crossed and they were coming through this quarry thicket in this sort of direction. So hopefully the trail will pick up the tracks on this road a little bit further up. And there's been a lot of activity of general game here on Sandy Patch, this burnt area, so I'm hoping that perhaps he is still around. The Maasai Mara is back and the first Wild Earth expedition is underway. Join our expeditioners on the 6th of August as they chat around the fire after a week in the Maasai Mara. Along with our Kenyan hosts David and Isaac, they will discuss the best moments from the expedition. Open to all Wild Earth viewers who have registered for free on our website. Scan the QR code to find out more. So I started watching Wild Earth at the beginning of COVID and I haven't looked back since. I've seen all of the leopards I wanted to see in Marives. He's been so playful and such a character. I had to remind myself to breathe at some points. <laughs> to see those two cubs made me very emotional. It's just been brilliant. It's just blown me away. Some elephants pass through here as well. I can see tracks on top of the vehicle tracks from this morning. Uh, Jim, sorry, I, I got a question there, but you broke up FC just at the wrong moment there. Could you just repeat Jim's question for me? Sorry, Jim. I think you're asking would birds, would birds of prey feed on mongoose? Absolutely, yes, they would. Um, so any of the eagle species, some of the larger hawks and, and a lot of the raptors here, uh, definitely no problem. And that's often why there is, that's often why there is a sentry uh, on duty for these mongoose, so the other ones can scavenge 
uh, and then one is always looking out and they'll have different alarm calls being, uh, depending on whether they see a terrestrial predator or an aerial predator. But ultimately if somebody sounds the alarm they'll all rush back down into their hole. So yes, definitely birds of prey. Uh, anything, I mean, I've seen martial eagles take out mongoose before, but we've got a pair of African hawk eagles that we see from time to time uh, in this area of the reserve. They would be quite happy to snack on a little mongoose. Uh, where was I? I was in Kruger National Park a little while ago, and we had a nice sighting of a Wahlberg's eagle, which are not here at the moment. Those are summer migrants, uh, but he also had a, a young dwarf mongoose up in a tree that he was busy feasting on. Still looking very carefully for any evidence... Oh, sorry Rusty. Any evidence of these leopard tracks on the road here. But there's been a lot of hyena activity up here, which is odd. Are you scanning nicely, Impo? Yeah. Impo's yeah. got his eagle eyes out for us, so I'm hoping we see or hear something. I know there's a couple of uh, pans in here. In fact, I think there's one just here. Where is it? Somewhere in this road. There's a little bit of water somewhere on the left here. It's not there. I was thinking that might be a nice place for this leopard to go, but he's obviously been moving around in the heat of the day. I'm hoping he hasn't gone far, but you never know. Leopards are so adaptable, and particularly in an area where there is a large population of lion and hyena, which there is in the Sabi Sands, we have seen sort of over the years the leopards have become far more active during the heat of the day, and that's a really good way to avoid competition against your bigger brethren. A leopard will always give up its prey to a, a lion or a hyena, of course of that pecking order. I'm sure we all saw uh, what happened to our hyena, I think it was Ndebele, who's covered in cuts and scratches at the moment after it looks like a run-in with a lion. And so a leopard does not want to have that as a problem. The hyenas are good family members that uh, Ndebele will still probably be able to get some food. Uh, but if a leopard gets injured and a leopard can't hunt, there's not much it can do. Ah, oh, what's that? So I guess I'm going to jump out of the vehicle. I think I might have got some leopard tracks here, but you're, as always, welcome to come with me. Yes. Okay, here he comes. Where did you go from here? See anything on the road in front? So it looks like it may have gone straight over the road here. The last track that I can see is here. It's going to be difficult for you to see, but it's going in this direction. Well, we will move around and uh, check over in that area, I suppose, but always nice that we've still got the tracks. <laughs> Sorry, just making sure we're covering all bases. So this is that open area around Sandy Patch, uh, very close to where we had those buffalo this morning. Uh, the only thing that I'm beginning to get slightly concerned about is we're not far from our 
northern border now. I think we'll have to head up to Buffalo's cut line and just see if there's any tracks crossing. And if there isn't, we will come back and focus our search in this area off to my right. Next road along will be Aubrey's. So if we don't find anything crossing north, fingers crossed, everybody, fingers crossed, then we'll check Aubrey's. Come on boy, where are you? Hoping we just found him lying under one of these quarry bushes. Okay, Baobab Dam's just in front of us here. This is where we had all the buffalo this morning. So I'm gonna definitely come back and check here later on when it starts cooling off uh, in case any lions have followed. Of hyena activity. It always amazes me to see there's absolutely nothing there on that big open area now, and only a few hours ago there was probably three or four hundred buffalo milling around there. Okay, so this is Buffalo Cut Line. So again, I'm going to slowly patrol this for a few hundred meters, and I actually don't want to find tracks now. I think, Paul, if you can keep your eyes peeled over here somewhere, I shall stare at the ground. So we've had a lot of general game over the last couple of days and I don't see any at all now, which might have something to do with the fact that we've got a predator in the area. Might have stayed for a little bit. Come on boy, show yourself. thing but it's well worth it. I mean there's two ways of doing this in a commercial area. You know, you've got a lot of vehicles out, although we're out a little bit before the commercial game drives have gone out so we're on our own at the moment. Uh, but you can just sort of respond to the radio if somebody finds something we all share that information but there's something very satisfying even if it takes a couple of hours of finding your own tracks and following. Everybody, please I'll send you back over to Andrew. Yeah, let's see what Andrew's doing. Yeah, they have just come down to drink and they've just slightly moved off onto the sort of the perimeter of the dam here. And they're just feeding on the bushes. And there's a young elephant too. And if you look in the water, that shadow that's busy swimming around there, that is the uh, marsh terrapin or helmeted turtle, also known as. It's just funny, that's usually where the crocodile lies. And it would be very interesting to see how they would react with that young elephant busy walking around there. 
if that crocodile was there. But he's on the other side of the dam now, so he's basking on that side. But of course, the elephants, they definitely knew that. That's why they've probably come this way. Shame. They look like they're very, very warm at the moment, flapping the ears. This one looks like the ear is a little bit uh, bent over. You see that? Let me just make sure. Yeah, it looks like the um, the ear is folded. So it does happen if they damage the, the ear. Uh, the little bit of cartilage that they do have in the ear. Uh, sometimes it causes a fold or a kink. Like when you fold a piece of paper. And uh, once you fold a piece of paper, that line is there for good. So I'm going to make sure if I'm not seeing things here, I'm just going to have a look close in the screen here. Yeah? yeah, no, definitely, the ear is bent over there. So we will definitely be able to identify this elephant without a shadow of doubt in the future. It's the first time I've seen that elephant here. Hmm, it's interesting. I do believe Mishatu is uh, sort of in a drought at the moment and it does look that way if you look at the bush there uh, it seems a little bit dry and of course the land is quite bare at that in that area over there Delve deeper into what Wild Earth can offer you Register for free on our website and you can interact with our guides whilst watching your favorite show. Once registered, you will also have access to some extra special content. There might be something along here. I think we should go have a look. Registration includes filling in your email address and creating a password. It's that easy. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. There is a great proverb that has been passed down from generation to generation across the plains of Africa. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Join Wild Earth for a special lion safari on the 10th of August, broadcast to you live in celebration of World Lion Day. Witness the pride and joy of Juma, the Nkumas, the Talamatis, and the Avoka males who come roaring to your screens to tell you their story. Beautiful animals. For those that don't know, the scientific or Latin name for elephants, Loxodonta africana, directly translates into the African long tooth or the long tooth of Africa. It depends how you want to say it. Uh, relating to their tusks. So very, very straightforward, descriptive of the, the animal. I often think if elephants weren't out in, in nature anymore, what the bush would actually look like. And you would see a tremendous change in the bush, folks. It would become very thick and overgrown. There wouldn't be much pathways going into the bush. And there would be quite little movement uh, because of the resistance of the bushes. And elephants do open up the bush for the other animals. And they shape the environment, most definitely. It looks like one massive game trail going beyond those elephants over there. And uh, for a lot of historical roads that are in South Africa, which are, you know, over 200 years old, and there are a few, there's even one on Amakala, um, they are usually, were originally actually built on elephant game paths because they already cleared the way and made paths. And then later on, uh, perhaps uh, four trekkers or settlers or whatever the case may be they started to build roads on those game trails and some of those areas the roads are still very much there i know in the eastern cape there's a road in port alfred that was originally built on an old very old game trail in hoodspreit as well uh, close to juma not too far from juma about 90 k's to the 90 kilometers to the north there's a town called um, hoodspreit 
And one of their main roads was built on a game trail from Elephant. Shame, I think. Uh, busy feeding, but also trying to get a piece of shade there at the same time. I think these elephants are going to be here for quite some time now. <laughs> okay, let's try and zoom a little bit here. Okay, controls are a little bit naughty now. Oh, bless you. Bless you. Because she's reaching in there. It's amazing. There are some glitches on the screen there, we apologize for that. Oh, goodness. Okay, there is that. Okay, no, it's her trunk. I thought it was a young elephant's trunk, but it's her trunk. Now, most of the time when we think of elephants, we think destructive, um, they break things, they're clumsy. Yeah, they, they might be destructive, but that's Mother Nature's important role for them. They must be destructive. They must control the environment. But it's also amazing how delicate they can be. And it's said that elephants are able to pick up the size of a peanut. So imagine what a peanut looks like. They are able to pick up with the tip of their trunk objects up to the size of a peanut, a single peanut off the ground if they wanted to. So they can be extremely um, focused with their trunk, picking up really small things if they wanted to. I've seen an elephant pull a thorn out of its own foot once. Shame that youngster's looking for a little bit of canopy there. Even though it's winter and it's drought in Mashatu, these elephants are looking in very good condition at the moment. I know you can see the spine there, but that's natural, that's normal. And with all the elephants, it's not unheard of to see things like their hips or their pelvis. I think it's the pelvis they call it. You can see a remnant of their pelvis, and that's usually all the elephants. Brilliant sighting this. Folks, if you have any questions for any of the naturalists or myself, you're welcome to scan the QR code that's going to pop up. And then you can definitely get a hold of us.
can hear those ox peckers rasping away somewhere there. Oh, here's another elephant. Hello. Oh, shame. It's still a young elephant, that one. Probably on its fourth year by now. Looks like a young female elephant as well. big shadow there let's just move the camera okay but I believe Jade wants to say good afternoon to you all so we'll send you over to the Eastern Cape at Kazuka Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Kazuko Private Game Reserve where the day is starting to get a little bit more windy but still an absolutely gorgeous afternoon here in the Eastern Cape. For those who don't know me, my name is Jade Harris. It is my first day with Wild Earth. I've been spending all day with the amazing team and all the amazing viewers and it has just been fantastic. And I'm so excited to share this with you all. So as you can see, my frame is focused on the coral aloe um, and this is because the grey mongoose was just out and about and in between those rocks. So he just disappeared about five minutes ago so I'm just getting my camera ready and waiting for that and you know building that anticipation when hopefully he comes back out. Um, we've been having amazing bird sightings today with um, bathing, dust bathing, preening. It's been phenomenal. But just looking at this view in front of you, isn't the colors perfect? I mean, the way the pinks contrast with the greens, it's just gorgeous. Kazuko does have some beautiful scenery to show us. The coral aloe that has been that is around this waterhole is extremely important for the bird species of this area because it's a winter uh, pollen producer so in winter generally your resources are quite low so the birds can really feast on the aloes because they in winter produce high nutrient nectar that just helps all of the birds and that's why a lot of the birds also have breeding that starts in winter Hi Izzy, thank you so much for your comment, so am I. I can't wait to share with you all of the amazing bird shots we can do together. Oh. 
I just wanted to show you a little streaky headed seed eater, but unfortunately it flew away just as I got to him. That's the problem with trying to phot photograph birds is they are sometimes a bit quicker than I am. We are offering our explorers another extraordinary wild earth experience. Explorers stand a chance to win a three night stay for two at Amakala Game Reserve, picturesquely situated next to Addo Elephant Sanctuary Park. Enjoy an authentic bush lodge experience in the luxurious Woodbury Tented Camp and feel the heartbeat of Africa on exhilarating safari drives. Sign up to be an explorer today and you might soon be off to this untouched safari destination with wild earth. The Maasai Mara is back and the first Wild Earth expedition is underway. Join our expeditioners on the 6th of August as they chat around the fire after a week in the Maasai Mara. Along with our Kenyan hosts David and Isaac, they will discuss the best moments from the expedition. Open to all Wild Earth viewers who have registered for free on our website. Scan the QR code to find out more. We'll see and see what we can get. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who are watching, please remember that this is an interactive live show. Please do not hesitate to give us any questions, feedback, comments. We would love to hear from you. Now I'll take you, I'll take you over to Cedric. Let's see what he has for us. Uh, it's been kind of a warmish day today, so it is nice to see all these animals on uh, quarantine open area. We've got, the, of course, the virtual zebras, some impala, actually just enjoying the feeding and foraging around this clearing. This is some wildebeest as well to the left-hand side. But yes, what a beautiful afternoon it is. A little bit breezy, but good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold, and behind the camera this afternoon on Wendy, we've got Odie. So thank you for joining us and I'm hoping that we can show you some exciting stuff this afternoon. It is a little bit breezy, I think the wind is starting to come in a little bit, which is making it nice and cool, but it was about, what, 27, 28 degrees Celsius today. So, and it's nice just to see the zebras around here as well. And I think the zebras, the impalas all together, typical, oh, typical safety in numbers and uh, really enjoying each other's company and making sure that you know, they are looking out for any danger and helping one another. But one thing about the zebras, on very hot days, it's a typical thing. I mean, you know, as they are planes game, just like the wildebeest, the brindle gnu, they've got that uh, black, white, black, white stripes on them, or dark, light, dark, light shading of the brindle gnu. And on very hot days, especially up there in the north, Masai Mara, Serengeti, days of like a 40 45 degrees celsius days and there is no shade and they are on those big open plains of course the black does absorb that sunlight and white reflects it so with that black white or dark light dark light shading 
it creates a beautiful wind thermal above their skin so it can keep them nice and cool during really warm days so it's a nice adaptation of uh, these animals as well as of course you know that the impalas as well just really enjoy spending time on this open clearing it's much easier for them to spot anything that's really approaching them and they feel much safer especially that there is uh, wildebeest in the distance and there's just zebras and they know that they've got some eyes and ears or other eyes and ears to look out for any potential predators that is approaching them as you can see the wildebeest they are one or two three of them just relaxing of course the gnu and as it is relaxing on this open clearing many times you'll always find them together so yes of course the uh, messiah mara very shortly we are going to have those uh, big uh, or not big gigantic uh, migrations of uh, the wildebeest going of course from one side to the other side following the rain pattern and crossing those big river systems so I'm sure that is going to be happening very shortly so that is definitely something to look out for and that's definitely a, one of those magnificent moments of I can say animal movements and if you can see that so the brindle canoe or the blue wildebeest as we call them and one is standing up you can just see that dark light, dark light shading on the necks and on the body. And exactly that's the reason, just the same as the zebras. One way to kind of keep themselves nice and cool on hot days. But yeah, as you know, quarantine clearing is always, always got some potential game here. Yeah? It is cat today, so I'm hoping for some cats today. Anyway, while well, we are going to be uh, moving on, I think I'm going to head out towards Trials Dam where we had that female leopard tracks heading that into that direction. Let's head over to Pridelands with uh, Chris. I think he's got some elephant action that side. Yeah, I've said it before, there's such a lot of elephants currently on Pridelands. I mean, you can barely drive a road without seeing an elephant. And here yeah, we've got uh, a couple of young boys, young bulls, also slowly heading towards direction a leopard dam. And I think they uh, have had a nice little feed. They're still plucking one or two little bits and bobs but you can see them walking the straight line on the road there I think they're thirsty I think they are keen to get to leopard dams water it's quite good when they walk in a line like that Yeah, that one's shaking that grass to get rid of all the very dry out bits and only the last little bit of juicy green ones remain that's what he wants and as the grass is drying out remember they need to consume much more quantities in order to sustain themselves as opposed to midsummer when everything is green And you can see a lot of the trees have shed their leaves, or have started to shed their leaves. There's much less options left this time of the year for elephants to feed on. Also seeing a lot more ring barking now, or bark being stripped off.
as soon as this guy moves, we'll uh, probably try and move a bit forward. Oh, there's another bearded woodpecker drumming. Yeah, this guy is literally just still fixed on his grass there. Always enjoy watching Ellie's, as you know. Hi, Phoenix. This is one of the best herds that I've seen on Pridelands. Tell you one thing, here's this herd of a hundred elephants that occasionally come in and out. That's quite spectacular as well. But there's a lot of elephants out here at the moment, Finak. Small groups of bulls, big bulls, old bulls, young bulls. Uh, quite a number of breeding herds as well. And BK was framed up on the drongos there as well. That attracts a lot of drongos. Also one of my favorite birds. Just full of attitude. Right, we're gonna go closer a little bit to them. Otherwise we might just lose them. So BK will just go wide a little bit on his shot. Until we can get another visual. Well, they are still there. And I think we'll probably try and follow them all the way to Leopard Dam. I think they are also going to drink, perhaps play around in the mud, I'm hoping to get some swimming. I reckon he's beelining it straight towards Leopard Dam now. So he's gone off the road, so we're going to continue on the road, go around all the way to Leopard Dam, and then try and see if we can't get them to drink. Maybe even play around and have a mud fight. And the others are. Well, they're going straight, they want to go. Now they're moving quite fast. They're moving very, very, very fast. Or they want to go into the drainage. That's possibly the other. So I think I see they slowed down a bit now.
Right. Wild Earth Explorers is a club aimed at people who love nature and care about the earth we live on. First and foremost, if you join our club, you can watch Wild Earth completely ad-free. In addition, we have great monthly prize draws, a weekly newsletter, and access to some great extra content such as fireside chats, AMAs, and hangouts. For a small monthly subscription, you can join other like-minded viewers and be part of the club. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. After an exhilarating day of live safaris. What better than to cozy up around the fire? Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and let our guides enchant you with their stories and exciting animal encounters. And of course, stand a chance to join in the chat and get your questions answered in real time. So what are you waiting for? Join the Explorers Club today and start to enjoy our special evenings around the fire. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Okay, let's keep following them. They're just slowly moving. You're gonna have to keep moving every now and then, otherwise they might not we might lose them. Okay, I reckon let's go around. Let's let's because Leopard Dam's not too far from here. The others are already way ahead, so I reckon let's go to Leopard Dam. Do you agree? and wait for them. Maybe we can get something going on there, but perhaps an action or something like that. And it's a hot day, it's a warm day, you know, it's, 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 it's elephant water day. All right, Lawrence also found some elephants of her own, so while we make our way to Leopard Dam, Let's go and see what Lawrence elephants are up to. Good afternoon. Yes, we have just had the most wonderful sighting with Ellie's. Sadly, it's tailing off now and they are going down into the valleys. It's a grey, blustery, windy day here in Amakala, but it has been quite adventurous and I'm going to tell you all about it. But first things first, good afternoon. My name is Lauren and this them belongs to Morgan. Yes, and we are surrounded by the Ellie herd, but unfortunately most of them are behind. Morgan, are you able to show this mirror? Is that possible? Yeah. So you'll understand the situation. That is my side mirror. And that's where most of the Ellie's are. <laughs> so unfortunately... It is in the screen. Well done, Morgan. There is a big Ellie and another Ellie and lots of Ellies. So sadly, we're not going to give you that view. We do have one coming. I think it might be one of the males. It is one of the males. Now, who are you? You're not Afi and you're not Booty. might be Azika. Hello boy. Can I tell you about my morning? He doesn't seem very interested. But in all seriousness, for those of you that maybe don't watch Escape to Nature, we had one of the most in incredible sightings of all time. I've never experienced anything like it before in my 
my career as a naturalist. And the cheetah cubs made their first kill. It was long, it took about two and a half hours. It was extremely difficult to watch everyone, but they made their first kill. And I've informed the Amakala and I informed the ecology team. And the ecology team confirmed that that is the first one. So if you ever get the chance to watch it, I'm sure there'll be lots of clips, please do. It was unbelievable to see those cheetah cups in action. And it was more of a lesson it was more of a mum teaching and it took a long time and it was in fact a brand new baby springbok. So it was hard, it was difficult. But yes, Yuri, you were saying, wow, huge, I know. Especially when he was up, he's a little bit up on that ridge from the car. Now let me just see if uh, we can kind of, I think I've got space to turn now. So bear with me, I'm gonna do a big U-turn. And we can maybe get some Ellie bump. Oh, why are they running? There is another car there. Just ignore the vehicle. Azika, what are you up to? Oh, I think I know what he was up to. <laughs> I think there was a bit of a clue there. Um, yes. There definitely is a female coming into Eastress, and I think he was possibly chasing her. Okay, let me do a U-turn. And then we, I don't like when the animals are behind me. I like to just be able to see what's going on, especially on a windy day. Elephants are not massive fans of wind. Neither am I. Okay. I'm going to reverse a little bit more. But as you know, or maybe you don't know, tomorrow is my last day at Amakala. And then I'm off. I'm off to Scotland, then the Maldives, actually. I'm always in the Maldives these days. And I really wanted to catch up with this herd. Oh, it's Afstad. Afi, it was you behind the car. Ugh, my favorite Ellie. They are going down into a valley, which is really not ideal. But we can just sit here and admire the views for a moment because this valley is really deep and it is nothing short of spectacular. No way, Morgan. Did you honestly just spot us a secretary bird in flight? Yeah. Amazing. Um, can that vehicle pass, Morgan? All good? Yeah. Yes, there's a secretary bird in flight. I cannot believe that. Are you able to get a view of it from the other side? A long distance view, but yes. How cool! We were going to go and look for the secretary birds today and then we thought, oh, we actually want to spend time with the Ellies because, well, I haven't seen the Ellies in quite some time. And there's Afi. Oh, I miss Afstad. Afstad. Afi, however you want to say his name. Almost a secretary bird elephant two shot, kind of. I'll take it. And I said this this morning, and I said it on Escape to Nature, but really this elephant hair is special. track the herd and I don't mean I track them what I mean is I've been able to keep tabs on them you know it's the same herd for example in Juma or maybe even Pridelands when you come across an Ellie you're not it kind of is just an Ellie yes we got to know Fang we got to know Norman for a while we got to know Daryl but really nothing like this nothing like a daily dose of the same Ellie's
That was very cool. Secretary Bird and Ellie's in the Valley of Amakala. We're going to try and see if we can get some better views for you all. And as we do that, we'll send you back to Chris with his Ellie's. Guys, I've just mentioned that herd of 100 elephants, and here they are at Leopard Dam. Just around us here is 30, and there's more inside the dam. Lots of babies, lots of cows. Here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, Just 35 that's just around us, and I've not even counted those in the water. How incredible is this? All the babies. This is going to be epic. Look at them on the other side. This is incredible. And I was just talking about this massive herd of elephants. This is a spectacle. To say the least. I mean, to our back, there's already about 20 elephants. It's already left the water hole. And look at them. Swimming elephants and babies. Hi, Jenny. Says Jenny loves elephants and thanks for this amazing sighting. Jenny, I tell you, I can just imagine how excited you must be just gauging at my own reaction here. We got elephants swimming. We had, I wish you can have a 360 view that I have. There's elephants all around us. This is that big group of over, well, close to, sometimes over 100, sometimes close to 100. This is special, guys. This is, I mean, like I said, I've just this immediate ring around us was about 30, 35 elephants. A whole bunch of them still that side. <laughs> wow. No, just to take a look at this. I mean, that says we're surrounded by elephants. Just take a look at what I just mentioned, eh? You just saw the elephants there. Look at all of them here. So now they finished washing and now they're dust bathing. Look at that. <laughs> oh, we're getting smothered in dust yeah <laughs> might need to give the lens a bit of a wipe so if you do see us wiping the lens it's because we might get some dust on the lens itself this is crazy stuff We are offering our explorers another extraordinary Wild Earth experience. Explorers stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at Amakala Game Reserve, picturesquely situated next to Addo Elephant Sanctuary Park. Enjoy an authentic bush lodge experience in the luxurious Woodbury Tented Camp and feel the heartbeat of Africa on exhilarating safari drives. Sign up to be an explorer today and you might soon be off to this untouched safari destination with Wild Earth. The Maasai Mara is back and the first Wild Earth expedition is underway. Join our expeditioners on the 6th of August as they chat around the fire after a week in the Maasai Mara. Along with our Kenyan hosts, David and Isaac, they will discuss the best moments from the expedition. Open to all Wild Earth viewers who have registered for free on our website. Scan the QR code to find out more.
absolute spectacle. Leah says this sight makes her whole ear. Absolutely, Leah, this is phenomenal. And what I love is that this whole this herd has been around Pridelands for the last. I mean, we saw them in May. We saw them in in June. They disappeared for a bit. Now they've been back for about a week or more, even. So, so, so nice. Very, very, very int amazing, interesting, entertaining sighting. <laughs> and now? Showing us, he said, I am a elephant and I can run you over. Wow, that's all I can say. It's, it's grooming time for them. Oh, there's more elephants approaching. I think it's our bulls from earlier. Approaching as well now. I don't think we're going to get them. It's right behind us. Oh, that's those bulls from earlier. Oh, there's one throwing a tantrum. Now, this wa washing, we've been through that. It's to cool them off. And it's a hell of a lot of fun for them. The dusting also got to do with parasite control, sunscreen. <laughs> Slice says, my uh, excitement is... <laughs> is contagious <laughs> you know, how can you not be excited by this this is insane it's the only word i have for this oh there is such a beautiful shot of these elephants approaching but i will have to let me just turn my car a touch and see what i mean Those, those bulls that we saw earlier, are they going to join the party? Yes, this is incredible, guys. It's, this is not all those bulls. This is different. This is different bulls now. This one is going to hopefully come close and check us out. It's just magic. And I'm sure BK is capturing this like a boss.
Isn't that such an iconic image of Africa? Elephant bull approaching with the marula tree right behind it or right under it. So sort of symbolic of Africa in a way. And while this guy's approaching us, just a reminder again, we're holding we're holding our first fireside chat from the Maasai Mara tonight at 8.30 p.m. in Kenya time, which would be 7.30 p.m. in South Africa. And we are looking at the past week, the best sightings, and we're also going to meet some of the expedition guests who's been enjoying the migration with us this week. This is open to all the viewers. Just scan the QR code on your screen to find out more about it. <laughs> How was that? How was that? I like I can't sit still. I need to I feel like I need to jump or something. <laughs> Celebrate in some way, you know, maybe I should shake my head around like some of these elephants It's just like that they all got just a couple of bulls left there Joel and the comment there is that we've been absolutely spoiled by elephants well it doesn't get better than what we just had you know it's not I mean a hundred elephants in today's modern world is a very big herd historically much bigger herds were documented in the 1800s and even before that and in today's life it's exceptional to see a herd of elephants, a hundred or more. Not an everyday occurrence. There's places where you will get bigger herds. Yeah, BK says we should go and try and see if they're not also going to do a bit of a mud bath. So now my nose is slotted up with all that dust. Oh, I'm going to sound like a trumpet tomorrow. I think we might be in for some luck. I think they are going to go and dust bath. See if we can get a gap here. Ah, the bush is in front, but I think that's the best we can do for now. Yo, my heart is beating like I've just run a hundred meter sprint. I mean, it's no secret that elephants are my favorite animal. So having a hundred of them surrounding your car, it does not get better than that. What do you reckon, BK? Okay, you've only been here for a few days, but Definitely the Prideland sighting of the week, yep. possibly the month. There's a few contenders for that, but we'll get back to that later. <whistles> yeah. 
Yeah, well, after that mayhem, an absolute sheer, I don't know what, what we're going to call it, insanity, really. <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a slow step back and head back to Ben on his bumble. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Oh, we're still having a look around this area for these uh, leopard tracks, but still no luck yet. But it's still a bit warm. Hopefully, when it cools off, uh, maybe we'll get some better luck. But what I did find was this, which is the shell of a giant African land snail, which is the largest terrestrial snail in the world. Um, this one is dead. As you can see, there is nothing left inside. Uh, we normally see them on the road, or sometimes see them on the road during the summer months when it's wet, and during the, the dry winter period, uh, they will either sort of go under the leaf litter or actually bury themselves into the ground um, and wait for those first rains. And after heavy rains, it's quite normal to see these land snails out on the road again. Uh, but very cool to see. This is a medium-sized one, I would suggest. Uh, they do get bigger than this. Uh, obviously, as with all shells, the shell grows with the the snail as it gets bigger as well so it's not like a hermit crab and every time it grows it has to go and find another snail um, and you can actually see some of its sort of life history by looking at the the coils on the shell here so some people say you can age it by the number of ridges but it's more uh, it's very inaccurate it's a bit like trying to age a tortoise by the ridges on its scoots on its shell as well but what is interesting is you can see that every now and again it's had a fairly traumatic moment you can see a big crack uh, there there's another one across here. So what's likely to have happened then is that probably maybe a buffalo or an antelope or something trod on it and broke the edge of the shell and it, uh, it had to repair itself and we can see evidence of that uh, in the shell. Uh, this is made out of like a calcium carbonate substance. So one of the interesting diets that snails have is they will sometimes practice what we call osteophagia, so eating on bones. They have this sort of almost like sandpapery tongue called a rostrum, uh, and they will sort of gnaw at bones and uh, other things that contain calcium, so maybe even the soil and maybe even rocks. Um, and there have even been reports of them eating things like concrete because we put calcium in concrete as well, and they can actually do structural damage to houses. One of the other things they are known to eat is elephant dropping, uh, elephant dropping, so as if uh, bird droppings, uh, again because there is a sort of a calcium crystals uh, in that uric acid as well. Um, and there's a very interesting parasite. We often talk about this symbiotic relationship to parasitism and the classic example is an oxpecker and a buffalo and, um, and how the two sort of help one another or a tick on an animal being a parasitic relationship. But there are some really interesting relationships out there, including one called a green banded brood sac, which is a type of worm that lives in the feces of birds and snails come along and eat that. And then these little worms develop inside the... Oh, sorry. They develop inside the snail and then migrate to the tentacles of the snail and then they, they get very close to the skin and they kind of pulsate with funny colours and it looks like a caterpillar to a bird. So, and it also affects the snail's behaviour. The snail will be out in the open more, be more obvious, feed on higher vegetation because the parasite is almost doing a type of zombie brain control on it because it, that parasite needs to be eaten by a bird to continue its life cycle. So that little flatworm migrates to the tentacles. You can see these sort of pulsating tentacles that attracts the attention of a bird, comes down, eats those, and then that little worm ends up in the bird's stomach where it can uh, lay its eggs. And then again, when the bird uh, poops and creates that uric acid, out come the, the little larvae and the eggs and they're eaten by a snail. And so that process uh, circulates. So very interesting to think that this particular flatworm needs two different, completely different species to proliferate itself and it can even control the behaviour um, of a snail in order to, 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 to achieve its sort of life goal. So nature is very, very cool. So yeah, so giant African land snail. Okay, I'm still up in the area around Baobab Dam where we had those buffalo this morning. Um, I've got various leopard tracks now going in various different directions so to be honest I'm not a hundred percent sure where said leopard may be uh, and I'm tired of just guessing <laughs> so we're going to drive around and enjoy it as the evening cools off hopefully we get some alarm calls I'm checking the big trees uh, in case a, an impala succumbed 
uh, to a leopard in this area and obviously if we have any new updates you guys will be the first to know but let's carry on but always nice to see some of the smaller things as well it's not just about the big things and often when you're looking for the big things that's when you find the really interesting stuff I've never seen one of those brood sacks personally but I've seen video of it it's weird this thick this green and cream stripy thing that infests the tentacles and they, they pulsate and they move but it's all designed to attract the attention of a bird they do say that a bird doesn't eat it so the snails have been shown to you know, still survive for a year or two even with this thing living in its eye stalks which is a pretty horrifying thought Ooh, a track there so it's always good just to check these game trails. Just going to quickly check this game trail. It's difficult to see when it's on the other side of the vehicle. I thought maybe I saw a, a track here. No, it seems not. I think what I saw was one of the uh, the skin on the back of an elephant's pad. You get all that cracked skin and it leaves those very um, obvious marks in the sand you can see here. And just some of them looked as if there might have been a few toes there. Okay, I'm going to continue bumbling around up in the northwest here, see if we get lucky. In the meantime, let's send you over to Cedric to see what he's found. Followed him a little bit and he came out onto the bank as you see now, showing himself in full glory. It's actually quite a nice view of him because he's laying out straight, but there's no point of reference there. So if I had to estimate his size, as I've mentioned before, I think it's about two and a half meters or so. But it's just amazing how his tail is almost as thick as the widest part of his body there which or the, the tallest part of his body there which just illustrates exactly how powerful that tail is interesting animal crocodile Okay, sorry about the glitches there. I just want to zoom out just a little bit so you can actually see his length. Hopefully his tail is straight out like it was. Okay, I'm not sure why these controls are not responding. I've just refreshed them. Okay, there we go. So as straight as you can get in terms of the tail, so it's a decent sized crocodile this. It's actually an interesting one because most people think, you know, crocodiles are going to eat a lot of game and take a lot of the animals that come down to drink, which, yeah, they'll, they'll definitely predate on them. But at least 70% of their diet actually consists of fish. 
mainly catfish and barbel. And the rest will be mammals of sort. Here's crocodiles enjoying this warm day. I think that soil must be really nice and warm, taking in that warmth. I think we often think of crocodiles as slow moving animals, especially when they're on land. But uh, you wouldn't believe it, crocodiles can move incredibly quick when they lift their body off the ground and they run. They can run and they can really move fast. Fantastic sighting this. Folks, if you have any questions, you're welcome to scan the QR code that will come up. And you can send us some of your questions, some of your thoughts. Ginormous one, this is still... Can definitely get a lot larger than what he is now, but still a decent sized croc. But in the meantime, let's send you over from Mashad to, to the Eastern Cape, far distance away, with Lauren at Amakala. We tried to get the Ellies on the other side of the valley, but they were just too deep in the valley and it's beautiful up there lots of euphorbia triangularis and all the lichen especially the old man's beard just draping off all the trees makes it look very jurassic park-esque if i must say but we have come across some Ireland, the antelope that finally wormed its way into my heart yes you did <laughs> Immediately, I think people are taking with the sort of smaller animals or the smaller antelopes. But once you start spending time with Ireland, my goodness, they're fantastic. We just got stopped by a vehicle who also spoke about our sighting this morning. It really has gone quite famous or viral within Amakala. But once those little Cheetos get the hang of what they really have to do, they're not there yet. Mum is trying very hard. She's got a lot of patience. Once they get the hang of it, that'll be it. I think nothing will stop them. Would you like to have your finger on the pulse of Wild Earth? Are you curious about what happens behind the scenes? And would you like a catch up on the best moments from the week? delivered straight to your inbox. How cool is this? And oops, don't lose it, don't lose it. Then it's time to join the Explorers Club and receive the weekly newsletter. Head over to our website to find out more. Delve deeper into what Wild Earth can offer you. Register for free on our website and you can interact with our guides whilst watching your favorite show. Once registered, you will also have access to some extra special content. There might be something along here. I think we should go have a look. Registration includes filling in your email address and creating a password. It's that easy. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. There is a zebra in the background. Do you see that, Morgan? One o'clock, way in the distance. You can get a zebra on top, of the on top of the Irland, yes. Standing on top of the Irland. Amakala just keeps getting better and better. It definitely doesn't beat Ralph's story about the baboon riding the warthog. And ladies and gentlemen and MC, you must ask him when he starts on Monday to retell that story. Yes. It is a story like you will never have heard before. I 
I just love these vast open plains. It is so different from areas like the Sabi Sands, especially in summer. Obviously, we're not in summer right now. I know that. But in summer, it's so dense and thick in the sands. It's just, well, as many of you know, we probably drive past a lot of things. But there are so many wonderful things about summer. Seasons change. They come and go. And all of them are necessary. All of them play their part. But... I just love the Amakala wide open space and it will be like this even in summer. Secret Mash. I do get asked this question a lot and it's not actually proven. It was thought that it could possibly have a function in sexual selection obviously our friend Charles Darwin came up with natural selection which was fantastic but he realized mm, there are a few things here that are not fitting the bill for natural selection for example some male antelopes with horns a lion's mane a peacock's wonderful tail feathers <laughs> Sorry, I'm just really distracted by this war talk. Um, they are, of course, going to run away. Yes, you keep running. And then he came up with the idea of sexual selection, that there are certain traits in the animal kingdom that don't really perform a function per se, like a lion's mane, but its, its function is to attract the females and show that they are the one for the ladies in sexual selection. So it was thought that possibly the dewlap was for sexual selection within the eland, but the more accepted theory now is for thermal regulation, sacred mash. And it sort of increases the body surface area. So maybe not in areas like Amakala, but in more dry or arid areas, these animals that are able to sort of be water independent have a greater surface to body ratio and that means that they can sort of thermorate, thermoregulate their bodies easier they can cool down easier and retain heat easier so that's sort of the reason for the dewlap i don't think you can see any dewlaps here but when you do look closely you'll see that it is just loose skin and it will increase that surface area And you know, this, the sighting with the cheetah this morning was obviously very difficult, but it was a springbok baby, a newborn. And while it was very small, not insignificant, but I just mean the size was small, but there are cheetah close by here, I think still in the Eastern Cape on Mount Cambodou, is that right? Yes, something like that. And the cheetah hunt Eland. They take down Eland. It's a female cheetah and she takes down Eland, adults not just calves. Our cheetah, Pumalela, she could easily take down a calf, but there are cheetahs that are highly specialized to take down prey much bigger. And look at the size of these Ilans. They are huge. Also, Chemsbok. It's dangerous. It's not an easy hunt, but some cheetahs can do it.
the lions here also don't go for the ill land yet but i'm not sure if this male lion on amakala will change as he gets older but right now he very much enjoys warthog Patrick, you are asking how high can an Ilan jump? And that's an interesting question because you obviously already know that they can. An Ilan, believe it or not, they are incredibly bulky animals with a lot of muscles on their skeleton. They're very heavy and yet they're one of the most elegant runners. If you just watch them and you see them run, you be blown away they can really run and i'm not talking about trotting they can sprint away and of course as you seem to already know they can jump they are said to jump up to about 20 i mean 2.5 meters sorry i'm not very good at feet i think it's times three so let's go for around eight feet Sorry if I'm wrong on that one. But they are said to jump about 2.5 meters, which is really high. And I believe some of the highest recorded jumps reach 3 meters, which would be around 9 feet. So considering their body mass, it's really quite something that they are actually able to jump that high. I've not seen it personally, but I have seen them run. And it's really quite spectacular. Have we lost all visual, Morgan? We have. We have. We've got the clouds. <laughs> we have clouds. That's good. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> no more zebras walking on elands. Is that the secretary birds? I don't think. There's two things flying. Two of them in flight. No, there definitely was a bigger bird there, Morgan, than a crow. Uh, I just saw a crow. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a crow, for sure. Um, Lee, you are saying those earlands are very majestic. Are very majestic, yes. They really are. And I am annoyed at myself for not spending more time with them in the Maasai Mara, but the Maasai Mara is a very overwhelming place. So lots to see, lots to spend time with. So I'm very glad that I've managed to just stop and spend time with them because I'm a big believer that when you spend time with animals, I think one is popping out now, you really get to observe them, get to learn them. You sort of create a relationship between yourself and the animal. And at the end of the day, life is all about connection. The world, the biomes, the habitats, the ecosystems and the species, including us, are a lot more interconnected than we think. We are more intricately woven into nature than we realize. We've forgotten about that. We've stepped away from that. But we do need to rebuild our relationship with nature. And Lee, it is all about connection. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But we want to let you know that we hear you. You can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad free. Head over to our explorer page to find out more. We are offering our explorers another extraordinary Wild Earth experience. Explorers stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at Amakala Game Reserve. Picturesquely situated next to Addo Elephant Sanctuary Park, enjoy an authentic bush lodge experience in the luxurious Woodbury Tented Camp and feel the heartbeat of Africa on exhilarating safari drives. Sign up to be an explorer today and you might soon be off to this untouched safari destination with Wild Earth. And just re-emphasizing that point about interconnectivity, the 
There is a fantastic book that I am reading by one of my favorite authors, and it is called The Tapestries of Life. Her name is Anne. Her surname, unfortunately, I really cannot pronounce, so I shall not. But The Tapestries of Life, it really is just a fantastic book, and I recommend it because it will touch on interconnectivity and how everything really is just one big tapestry. And before I forget, I had my fireside chat at Amakala last night. But of course, tonight there will be a fireside chat in the Maasai Mara, my favorite place. Now, it is at 7.30 South African time, which is 8.30 Kenyan time, but that's okay. And they're going to be reflecting on all the wonderful sightings of the past week, the sightings and meet some of the expedition guests who are enjoying the migration. So scan the QR code that's going to pop up on your screen to find out more. Are you loving this site in Morgan? Oh, <laughs> I do think this sighting is long over. However, it was wonderful to see Ilan. I think we're going to bumble a bit. We are going to leave the clouds, although they are beautiful clouds. I don't spend enough time looking at clouds, and that's very naughty of me. Davi is obsessed with clouds. You also got people that have a phobia of clouds. What's that called again? There's a name. There's a hole. Jolly good we didn't go into it, right, Morgan? We got a flat tire the other day right next to the male lion. That was fun. And the female lions too, yes. And you guys saw none of it because we had a flat tire. Yes, that was troublesome. But Sod's Law, Murphy's Law, whatever you want to call it, it always happens. However, yes, clouds. It's been a long stint, everyone. But I am starting to feel a little bit emotional about leaving Amakala, I must say. It's just been so wonderful. And I really wish Mor Morgan and Ralph the best sightings. But no art wolf, no brown hyena. I'll send you a picture on Monday. And no art fark. But everything else, enjoy. Enjoy. The brown hyena sightings are going to be epic. I will be devastated, but that's okay. I will cry. But I will also be in the Maldives, so, you know, one or the other. Okay, clearly I'm talking a lot of nonsense, so I'm going to try and find some more animals for you all. And as we do that, we're going to send you over to Ben, who's doing some birding. Thanks, Lauren. Well, we're doing a little bit of birding. Hoping this bird will turn around for us because this is an absolutely stunning bird, but we're seeing it sort of more camouflaged back. You might be able to see that it's got like this very established face mask, a bit like Zorro. Um, it's called a golden breasted bunting, and if it was to turn around, hoping you'll see this incredible golden yellow chest and breast that it's got. Uh, it really is very, very striking, hence the name golden breasted bunting. Um, but yeah, currently he's got his back to us, but this is typical bird of course, well, at least it's actually here. Normally they fly away just before we go live. But a very very pretty bird. Hopefully you can see when he turns his head you just might get a little flash of that of that yellow. We had a southern black tit earlier that was making one hell of a fuss to the point where I actually uh, got off and went to go and have a look what was bothering him so I thought perhaps we'd get a, a snake or something. Uh, but alas, I think in hindsight he was probably shouting at me. Uh, I'll show you quickly the picture in the book of the bunting because we didn't get a really clear look. Uh, but maybe before you can zoom in, here he is, bottom left, golden breasted bunting. So you might have been able to make out this very distinctive black and white um, eye stripes that it's got on the head. And then you can see this beautiful yellow chest. This picture really doesn't do it justice. If you get it in the right light early morning, um, late afternoon like it is now, it is absolutely spectacular. Um, they're little insect eaters, but they will also eat seeds. You can see by the shape of the, the beak, this sort of conical shape beak here, that's more designed for crushing seeds, but they will also eat uh, insects as well. A lot of seed-eating birds will actually feed their chicks on insects uh, because it's a very, very good source of protein whilst they're growing up. 
Uh, and then once they sort of reach adulthood, uh, then they uh, revert more to a, a granivorous diet. So the granivore is a, is a seed-eating bird. A very pretty, very common here, and actually I'm very happy it sat still, even if only briefly. Okay, but we're bumbling along uh, above us a cut line. I've, I think it's fair to say I've given up on this, this leopard. I might pop back there a little bit later when it cools off and starts getting dark. Um, but I tire of driving around hoping that one just appears miraculously in the road. I've decided to go and look for small stuff, interesting things, bugs, trees, birds, and if we do happen to find something... Nobody's checked the northeast this afternoon, so I thought we'd go and have a look at that side of the reserve. So hoping for some Ellie's. I could quite happily watch Ellie's all day, every day, and after such a great elephant day yesterday, um, they've all seemed to have deserted us today. Probably some Ellie's that were having a splosh around in the mud at some point, but nothing currently. I'm still hoping that uh, there would be some lion tracks coming across from Buffalo's Hook after we heard them last night, but nothing yet. But I'll just go and check Buffalo's Hook Dam, and I'm sure that our hippos. I'm sure we'll find a few hippos there. They've normally got that little group of four hippos, and they're always entertaining to watch, especially late afternoon. We might get a few yawns and a bit of interaction between the, the members of the pods there. There's quite a few zebra tracks here as well. We've actually seen some very nice birds this afternoon, but they're just so difficult to frame up for you guys. That's an old leopard track. Um, I think I'm going to make it a personal mission to try and show you guys a fire finch. I don't know if you've ever seen a fire finch. There might be some at Buffalo Soak Dam. Little tiny birds about this big, but they flit all over the place. So if you've seen the blue wax bills, oh, we've got some warthogs about the same size as the blue wax bills. They're going to run across the road. Oh, <laughs> good work, Paul. Uh, they also didn't. It's the second set of warthogs we've seen in the last 10 minutes that are absolutely adamant that they do not want to be on camera today. But I'm hoping later when it starts to get uh, dark, we'll do another little um, astronomy section and we'll, we'll talk about another constellation. Interestingly, Orion's Belt, which some of you may well know, a very famous constellation. Um, in some African cultures, the three stars of Orion's Belt were seen as uh, three warthogs, because often warthogs are seen in threes with a mother and two babies. It's often how they are depicted. Uh, and they say that yeah, the three stars of Orion's Belt were three warthogs running across the sky. Uh, others suggest that the three stars of Orion's Sword, which is just sort of underneath the belt, from our, above the belt from our perspective, that the three stars of the sword are the three warthogs, and they're being pursued by three dogs represented by the belt. So that's personally what I love about all this idea of uh, different cultural mythologies that so many people kind of saw the same thing but depending on their particular interests and their particular experiences uh, that's the story that gets projected onto that individual constellation and you can have in one country you can have three four five different beliefs but what I do find very interesting is that even though the mythologies are different the even across the world the majority of cultures see the same shapes 
as the same things, just adapted slightly for their own religion or their own cultural beliefs, which I think is a nice indication to show that mankind started in one spot and has slowly spread out across the globe. And then those first stories that probably originated here from Africa have actually been translated into different cultures as humans have expanded over the globe. So we might have a few signal issues. There's lots of little birds flitting around. There are some wax bills off to the right. I don't know, Paul, how uh, how good you're feeling with this the wax bill just at the back of this tree, but I think that's going to be very difficult for you to get. There's also a little something flitting around next to us, a little cysticular maybe. Oh, we do. you've got him there. Oh, typical. I think that was a little rattling cysticular. Um, all right, we're going to keep doing some birding. And let's send you back over to Andrew at the waterhole and see what he's found. We've really started to quieten down here at Mishatu in Botswana. But there's always something to look at. And definitely a beautiful sunset beginning to, to brew. There's a very active forktail drongo here. Wild Earth Explorers is a club aimed at people who love nature and care about the earth we live on. First and foremost, if you join our club, you can watch Wild Earth completely ad-free. In addition, we have great monthly prize draws, a weekly newsletter, and access to some great extra content such as fireside chats, AMAs, and hangouts. For a small monthly subscription, you can join other like-minded viewers and be part of the club. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Okay, and just to recap, for those that don't know what Mashatu means, it's actually a very interesting definition. Uh, it's uh, meaning the, the land of the seven giants. And uh, the seven giants are as follows. It's African elephant, lion, giraffe, baobab tree, elant, ostrich, and the quarry busted. Uh, and that makes up the seven giants, giving the name Mashatu in their local language. So it's based in the northern Thule. Uh, it's about 31,000 hectares out there. So this is really, it's land in itself. We can't really call it a game reserve. We can call it a game land. And that's exactly what it is. It's spacious and lots and lots of space. So the northern Thule is uh, situated in the easternmost extremity of uh, Botswana where Botswana, South Africa and Zimbabwe converge. And it's interesting, Mashatu is uh, jointly conserved by all three countries. So triple the support. And it's absolutely a, a bonus for this big land. <laughs> and that fork tail drongo is still going on there. Beautiful, really nice there. I'm just going to move the camera a little bit to the right. Okay, 
Crocodile is still there on your far right side there. I'm not sure if you can see when you look into the bush there, you'll notice where the canopies of the trees start. And then from that point, going down towards the ground, it's almost like a, a level point there. See that? That's what we call a browse line. So more than likely impalas, that's where they come through. That's where they can reach the leaves. They pick them off and they leave a beautiful line throughout the canopies of the trees. Giraffes as well with the thorn trees, they can actually shape the trees by in which the ways that they, they feed on the trees. Beautiful. Let's see if we can't get into that browse line so you can see what I mean. There's a good example out there. Ooh, lots of uh, glitches there on the screen. Sorry about that. And there's the crocodile's tail. <laughs> and there's the crocodile. And there's a Cape Turtle Dove or Ring Neck Dove just moving out of the way there. Okay, let's level off the camera back to the front. Let's just uh, scout all the way to the left side and then zoom back. All right, so uh, let's send you over to Ben, who I believe has got some hippopotamus. Yep, thanks Andrew. I have more than a hippopotamus. I've got, well, two, so like five hippopotamuses. <laughs> uh, but just before you join us, we were rather distracted because off to my right, I'm at Buffalo Dam, by the way, but somewhere in that drainage line, a bunch of Franklins has just gone ballistic. A grr, 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 and I can still hear them grrring in the background there, uh, which is uh, a reasonable sign that there's something in there that they don't like. Um, Unfortunately, there's no roads in that area, so we're just going to sit quietly at Buffalo Dam and watch these hippos for a while, and maybe we get lucky and something's on its way to the dam for a drink. But you can see they all look really rather relaxed, but I'm sure we'll get a little bit of activity in the next uh, 
half an hour or so, the sun is beginning to dip a little bit lower. Of course, that'll be time for the hippos to come out and go exploring and get their stumpy little legs working. Following their hippo paths, those game trails that we often ourselves walk when we're doing walks. You can always tell a hippo trail from another game trail by the fact that they leave this sort of mound in the middle because they've got such squat little legs and a big fat body uh, that there's kind of a gap uh, on either side of the, the body. So you see the almost two tram lines where those little stumpy legs are, are walking uh, and just where the belly is, uh, is is a sort of a gap. So very easy to see a hippo trail. Looks like quite a young one there. It's difficult to see at the moment, but I just see a small head sticking up. The calm before the storm, before they come out this evening. But it's a very peaceful evening here. It's a lovely temperature. It's beginning to cool off a little bit now. And uh, we've got some nice sort of cirrus or also stratus uh, clouds forming as well which means that we might have an absolutely spectacular sunlight uh, sunset tonight uh, if we do if these clouds do sort of stay like these high these high clouds are often actually ice particles up in the atmosphere um, and that creates some gorgeous colors refracting the light and hopefully we'll get some reflecting off this water here Just still amazed how much water is still in Opelsuk Dam in early August. Last time I saw this around this time of year, um, there was two little puddles separated by a great big sandbank between them. And there's no sign of that at the moment. From one side to the other, it's probably 80 to 100 meters. It's a lovely, peaceful scene. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But we want to let you know that we hear you. You can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our Explorer page to find out more. We are offering our explorers another extraordinary Wild Earth experience. Explorers stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at Amakala Game Reserve, picturesquely situated next to Addo Elephant Sanctuary Park. Enjoy an authentic bush lodge experience in the luxurious Woodbury Tented Camp and feel the heartbeat of Africa on exhilarating safari drives. Sign up to be an explorer today and you might soon be off to this untouched safari destination with Wild Earth. So in a lot of the local communities, uh, water is a, a precious resource and if there is a, a river or a lake close by, uh, then they will often head down there and late in the evening. Uh, one has to be very careful. Uh, Jessica, they are very relaxed, you're quite right. They're particularly relaxed for this time of the day. I was hoping we would have a little bit more activity, say maybe some yawning, some, some grooming, some little play fighting amongst one another as they get ready for their evening activities. But not yet, it seems. There are just a few spines and nostrils above the water now. But remember, hippo in the water is not a particularly dangerous proposition unless you come across a very grumpy territorial bull. Uh, but this is their comfort zone. This is where they like to be. This is where they feel safe. Um, and they will generally prefer to stay within the water unless they have to. The da real danger comes if you bump into a hippo on land because then he's out of his comfort zone. Um, Karen, no, not only when they have young ones. Obviously, uh, you know, one must be very careful of a female with a calf and she will defend that calf with her life, as will most animals, uh, for that matter. Uh, anywhere you find parental care in the mammalian kingdom, you'll find a very protective mother who will 
potentially sacrifice herself. Um, you've also got to be very careful of, say, the dominant male hippos. The, the territorial bulls can be very cantankerous, a bit like the buffalo we saw this morning. Um, there have been various reports, I don't want to scare anybody, of course, these are not not many in the scheme of things but of them attacking boats particularly up in the uh, in the delta in Okavango Delta in Botswana where they do these Mokoro safaris uh, which are like um, canoes they have been known to attack some of those and attack boats uh, but more it's just any hippo outside of the water particularly at night time uh, if it comes across a person is uh, is going to most likely ag act aggressively their idea is of course they want to get back to water where they feel comfortable no, oh, Bo's on the <laughs> trying to keep up with the pied kingfisher. Oh, there he goes. He's sat sat nicely for you there. To see if we can see if it's a male or a female, we can tell that by looking at the at the breast band. But it needs to be facing us for that. Can't tell from the back, but if he was to t he or she was to turn around. Um, then we can have a look. If it's one, sort of two little patches, almost like wearing a bra, then that's a female. Uh, and if there's the two patches with a band underneath, that's a tuxedo, and that would be the male. Okay, I'm going to see if I can sex this kingfisher, see if we have any activity from these hippos, and wait to see whether whatever upset those franklins and spur fowls off to my right maybe makes an appearance. But, but while I do that, let's send you across to Cedric and see how his bumble's going. Yes, I'm still heading out here, still looking around for any of the, the cats for cat today. Uh, I am on Rebecca's Road, I'm, he I'm heading in into a westerly direction. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> I'm, oh, girl, Wendy doesn't want to listen to me, yeah, let's just put it that way. I'm heading in a westerly direction, there is buffalo, a nice herd of buffalo that is coming over. So I'm going to go head into that uh, area where those buffaloes are. You never know, maybe we are lucky with lions following them because the Telemates, they did go into Arethusa this morning and um, these buffaloes are coming out from Simambili, so not too far, but you never know. Or we might get something else on the way that side, so we are hoping and holding thumbs for that. But it is a beautiful afternoon. The sun is setting, it is still so, so warm and I'm sitting with uh, no jacket, no jersey, nothing on. It's, it's, it feels like it's still about 26, 27 degrees Celsius this afternoon, which is fantastic. Yes, so lovely, lovely, lovely. And uh, windy, please. So yeah, of course, uh, as you know, when he's just giving a little bit of trouble now and again, but we are working on uh, Wendy's little gremlins. So definitely I will be looking into our Wendy's uh, health in the next couple of days to make sure she is going to be running smoothly. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the joys of the bush. You gotta go on these dirt. You know, you can understand being on these roads all the time. It is really um, bumpy roads going into the bush, following animals into these real thick areas. Uh, look, I mean, look, Rusty and Wendy, they do take a lot of punishment uh, through their time. They have been in Wild Earth for quite some time. They are very well. Uh, recognized vehicles and characters on the show so you can understand that uh, there is always going to be some problem somewhere no 
I know that uh, Ben has been uh, trying to follow up on that male leopard uh, tracks that we had this morning. I'm not too sure who it was. It was it wasn't the biggest of tracks, maybe mid uh, mid age. So it could be maybe Marips, Sasha, even uh, Tlama, uh, Tavangumi. So yeah, I'm not too sure exactly, but it came all the way from the south. So I, I doubt Tavangumi. I don't think uh, any of those tracks have uh, been located, you know, fresher tracks this afternoon. But I am going to go towards, I am going to head towards those buffaloes and just to see if we can pick up on them and maybe we are lucky to have some uh, cats following that herd of buffaloes. But it's going to take us another five to ten minutes to get to them. So, and while we do that, let's head over to uh, Lauren in uh, Makala as uh, she's got a beautiful sunset, so, sunset, <laughs> sunset to show everybody. <laughs> I'm not sure I would call this a beautiful sunset, however, we have got dramatic skies, something nasty is rolling in. And I figured it out, well I googled it, <laughs> what would we do with that Google? Nephophobia is the fear of clouds. So if you do have that ladies and gentlemen, look away now, because that's a lot of clouds. It's engulfing the sun. I don't think we will see a sunset. It's very dramatic though. Look over here, Morgan, where it's just swallowing up the sun. We are up the mountain and the wind is really picking up. So we're probably going to bumble a little bit closer to home just in case the skies do break. They might not, but if they do, we don't want to get caught in it. Do you know anyone that really has a fear of clouds? I would like to know. <laughs> Morgan does. Are you are you filming with your eyes closed? <laughs> no, phobia is a strange thing. I had arachnophobia for many years and I'm still not great. And Bokmaki, these are all chiming in, they know the weather's turning in tune to the Schumann resonance. The frequency of the earth as well as the weather patterns, changes in atmospheric pressure. I think animals are in tune to so much more than we are. I try to get my head around it all, but there's just too much. Come on, brown hyena, just pop out. Just appear. I want to say like magic, but I will not use that word. But I would like the brown hyena to just appear. Would you like to have your finger on the pulse of Wild Earth? Are you curious about what happens behind the scenes? And would you like a catch up on the best moments from the week, delivered straight to your inbox? How cool is this? And oops, don't lose it, don't lose it. Then it's time to join the Explorers Club and receive the weekly newsletter. Head over to our website to find out more. And the Earth's energy, that Schumann's resonance I was referring to, is actually said to help human health. I was reading up on this and it's fascinating. It's apparently able to travel up trees via sort of water 
and that's why you really should hug trees. You see these people hugging trees? Steve Falkenbridge loves to hug a tree. But do it. It's actually really, really good for you. And the reason is the Earth's energy is traveling up and down there. Whew, okay, everyone, we are going to head closer to home. This is looking a bit nasty, but I do believe that Chris has a much better sunset than we do. You know what? I was just touching to BK earlier then after that incredible elephant sighting that we had. Wouldn't it be amazing if we can top it up with another very special sunset here at Brightlands. And this is as good as it gets. We've got a little bit of high-lying cirrus clouds, those hair-like clouds. Those are very, very high clouds. They consist mainly mainly out of ice very high far far upper layers of the atmosphere and from a sunset perspective it's going to create this beautiful orange glow very very soon let's just sit and watch this unfold One thing I love about the elevation that we have here. Danielle also agrees that this is the best part of the day is a, a Brightland sunset. And and it's about the elevation we have, you know, it's it's and, and, and the open nature of the bush here, you know, is you, know, you can really get above the skyline like we do now. And we're not even on top of a hill, we're just on a bit of a, a slight rise. Basically, uh, a bit of a sort of watershed, if you want to call that. Uh, the only thing that I'm worried about is that when we have these high lying cirrus clouds like this, it's indicating a change in weather. Now, I do know that there is a cold front approaching. Whether it will make its way all the way here remains to be seen. Sometimes these cold fronts pass underneath us further south. Corin also agrees. In fact, Corin says, wow! It's a really awesome sunset. No, this is one of the better ones, you know, so from an amazing elephant sighting to this in one day that's special. We've got about about two minutes and then the sun is going to be be down and it's also nice with that dead tree in the foreground just adds to the sort of magic.
always like it. It always appears bigger when it gets closer to the horizon, just like the moon when it rises or sets. They do appear bigger when it's close to the horizon. Seems like my timing is a bit out. Might have a minute or two longer. <laughs> Can hear some branches breaking behind us. I won't be surprised if it's more elephants. We know that there's plenty of them around at the moment. Harvey also says he really likes this watch the sun go down it's like that closure of the day you know it's almost like and i say this a lot but it's just like that that knot that you start up in the morning like a little rope you create a loop and then the sort of just the loop that comes back and ties it all up It's almost as if it's setting extra slowly for us today to witness all of it. And uh, again, often we don't get to see this. We might see the colors, but often there's clouds or something on the horizon. So we don't really see the sun drop below the horizon. So let's, let's watch this. Now it's going quickly. Look at that. The last little bit going now. Almost, 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 almost. Reggie says, breathe in and out and take in the moment. And it's going to happen just now. Let's see if we can see a green flash. And it's gone. I don't see a green flash though, to be honest. Apparently you need to watch it set over the ocean and you'll see a green flash. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. All right, so our light is fading soon, so let's go over to Ben in the meantime, who's out on the bumble. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, we're bumbling nicely around Bovelsuk Dam. I just we just did a quick loop of the area. Uh, not sure what uh, those Franklins were shouting at. What I can tell you is that my eye is watering like crazy because a little bug decided to take up residence in my eye whilst we were driving. 
uh, absorbing some protein as we speak. <laughs> so excuse me if I've got watery eyes. We're just going back around the back of back around the back of Bofosuk Dam. Maybe something came down whilst we were there. Otherwise, we were hoping to get that beautiful sunrise. I know you've had sunrise in Amakala and sunrise at Prideland, so I was hoping to have a bit of a sunrise off. Um, but it seems that the clouds have built a little bit more, and we haven't quite got that beautiful colours that I was hoping for. It's still very pretty, mind. So I'm just going to pull up to the dam. Pull up to the dam and we'll have a quick look at the sunrise. Sunset, even. Sunset. Oh, yes, Rusty does not want... Let me just give you a bit more height so there's views. We might just be able to pick up the hippos on the right as well. Let's sit quietly for a bit and see what happens. Have a bit of bit of quiet time. Hippos are still very relaxed. There doesn't seem to be any suggestion that they're going to get moving anytime soon. You, can hear the, you might be able to hear the peeping of the Pied Kingfisher, who's still around. And we did disturb a grey heron earlier. I've also heard some Franklins just doing their standard sort of late afternoon calls. And a golden-tailed woodpecker I just heard as well, making sort of a squawking sound. But otherwise, everybody seems very tranquil and relaxed this evening. Egyptian geese coming in. Here on Wild Earth, we love it when you interact with our guides while they are live. In order to do this, you must head over to wildearth.tv forward slash questions and submit your questions, comments and suggestions. Simple as that. And to make it even simpler, from time to time you will see a QR code on your screen. Open your camera phone and scan this code and it will take you straight to where you need to be. We look forward to answering your questions on this channel. We know that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But we want to let you know that we hear you. You can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad-free. Head over to our explorer page to find out more. Was just zooming in on our Egyptian geese that came in for a, a landing there. We have a male and a female. <coughs> and we've got a, a virtual starling sitting almost above us, so you can probably pick up in the mic that sort of almost like metallic sound. Oh, and there goes the woodpecker. Ah, oh, he's not going to stop. Yeah, some really beautiful colours now. It's beginning to develop, to develop nicely. It looks like the, as the sun is going down, so we're getting that refraction, and you can see those lovely lines of clouds in the sky. There's our virtual starling, who you can probably hear calling away in the background. Mm. Yeah, 
had some lions calling. It's a bit early for lions, but they sound far away, way over our northern boundary, unfortunately. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Terry, do you know what? I've never actually heard of a hippo being collared. Um, I think the nice thing about hippos is they're generally territorial and they're usually in the water, so it's not like a, a lion or a leopard that can roam you know, tens of square kilometres, if not more, in a day and want to be found regularly. If you want to study a group of hippos, then chances are they will remain in the same place. Uh, so collaring them is probably not necessary. They've also got massive necks, uh, and I guess there's always the concern they might get stuck on a branch or something under the water. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be able to surface. I think if you were going to collar a hippo, you'd probably do... Uh, what we do with some of the rhinos as well, which is put like an ankle collar on them with a, a GPS tracker around the foot rather than around the neck. Uh, but I've honestly never heard of a hippo being collared for research purposes. Sure, those colours are really developing nicely now. Yo. Having said that, it's interesting, this, I mean, we come past Bulfasog Dam quite regularly and the, the dynamics of this little pod of hippos seems to change quite regularly. The last two days I've been here, there have been four. I've just, um, after you left us before, I had a quick count. We've actually got six in here today. And I remember last time I was here, we had one and then three, and then at one point we had about eight or twelve, and then it was back to two or three again the next day. They seem to sort of drift in and out, um, probably wherever they are closest to... Um, you know, when sort of the sunrise is coming, they'll just make a beeline back to the same uh, dam. And if there are quite a few natural pans or, or quite a few pans with sufficient water in, in an area, you may find that one dominant bull will be dominant over one or two pans as well, and he will just sort of flit in between them. Forktail Drongo also admiring the sunset up here. So if you're watching this morning, we actually looked at a, a southern, oh, there he goes, a southern black flycatcher. It looks very similar, but doesn't have the fork in the tail and has a slightly different coloured eye. I have to say, it doesn't look as if our hippos are in any hurry whatsoever to do anything, so I think we'll enjoy the sunset for a little bit more, and then I'm going to try and yard a road north. Maybe, maybe, maybe Columba. We haven't had any tracks for her again this afternoon, so perhaps she's come up north. I know she used to like this area around Drakensberg and Gwari Pan and the Mawati, so you never know, maybe a last-minute leopard. We always live in hope. <laughs> Fiona, you're right. Yes, cotton candy is a lovely description, actually. It has got that, that very sort of soft pink of cotton candy. Uh, it's one thing with uh, with sunsets, eh? You could probably list about 20 different descriptions of colours that you could see up there. Everybody's colour palette is slightly different, if you like. Uh, and it really is such a spectacular time of day, especially in winter because of the dust in the air causing the refraction of the light to be a little bit more severe. Uh, filtering out a lot of the other wavelengths and just allowing those beautiful reds, oranges and yellows to come through. And then, as we say, these high clouds, little ice crystals way up in the sky are also um, refracting the light. 
It's lovely to see you. It's almost spanning the whole sky. And our little pied kingfisher is hovering against the backdrop of the sunset, which is rather spectacular. I think Paul's trying to find him. He keeps moving there. Ah, oh, he's got a bit too low now. It's amazing how they hover. They don't officially hover. It's not hovering as such. They they kind of almost sort of fly backwards and stall. The only bird that really can truly hover is a hummingbird. But and the only bird, strangely, over here in the whole of southern Africa, which has been recorded to actually officially hover. Uh, is a lesser kestrel, and it only does it very, very occasionally. So it's kind of a fake hover when you see uh, the kingfishers do it. He's angling his wings and, and using sort of wind resistance uh, as opposed to staying perfectly stationary like a hummingbird can, where he can move forwards and backwards and up and down. There he goes. Uh, Kimberly, I haven't heard anything about Swazi. I haven't been past the hyena den this afternoon. I know Cedric went this morning. Oh, did you get a fish? Uh, nope. Uh, Cedric went this morning and said she was uh, looking a little bit better in terms of her scars, but she was still very much favouring her, I think it was her back leg. Um, quite what happened, we're not sure, but I know Cedric thinks that maybe she had a run-in with a lion at some point last night. Um, so no official updates, but these animals are incredibly hardy, particularly hyenas, so I've, I'm confident that uh, Swazi will recover and she'll get back on her feet soon, hopefully with a little bit of R&R, &R, uh, and she will be fine. But we will, of course, give you regular updates. I'm not sure if Cedric has been past the hyena den this afternoon, but I'm sure we'll pop in there tomorrow and we'll see how she's getting on. We want to make it even easier for you to interact with our guides whilst watching Wild Earth. When you see a QR code like this pop up on your screen, then open your phone camera, point it at the code, and you will be taken directly to our question page. Simple as that. Then you can let us know what you want to see, ask questions, and much more. Well, I've had it before where I've been walking and a water buck's jumped out of the grass. It's quite a frightening experience. Wild Earth. Okay, I'm going to take a trip say, around the Mawati and see what happens. Let's send you across to Andrew in the meantime. So we're still here watching the sunset. And of course that folktale Drongo is still uh, giving some calls there that he's trying to mimic. I'm pretty sure there's some sort of an owl or something in the area here. I've been zooming around the trees and trying to look for it, so I just don't see anything. But as we know, owls do camouflage extremely well, and you really have to look hard for them. So I was doing some research. Um, Mashati is actually considered a semi-arid land. Um, they only get about 350 milliliters of rain per year which is pretty much the same as an area like the Kalahari. Um, so it's not a desert, but a semi-arid environment, as you can see here. If you compare that to Juma, I think Juma gets about 550 mils of rain per year. So vastly, vastly different. 
Oh, what is that sound there? Uh, it's definitely an owl or some sort of a bird of prey or something around the area. And stop now. Beautiful reflections, don't you think? There's a tawny flank prinia as well going off there. And if you heard that tweet, oh, fantastic. Um, Cedric has found something quite special for you all, so we'll send you over there. Okay, we're still watching the sunset. It's already gone down below the horizon. And there's that four-tailed drongo just flew past the camera. So I just want to take a side wind over here and scout to the far left and just see if we can't spot anything out there. Yeah, I definitely think there's an owl around here. I've only seen one that it flew past, so it was very difficult to say what it was. But that was two nights ago. Okay, let's go a bit more. See if we can't take this camera to the max. Some more. Okay, nothing that I can see. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the camera and then we're going to spend a bit of time on the frame just scanning through the bush to see if there's anything in that distant area coming towards the water. There's that forktail drongo flying around. Mm, which one is that? Sounds like could be. I think it's Natal Spurfowl, but I'm not hundred on that. It's definitely one of the Franklins or Spurfowls rather. 
Now, it's just amazing when you don't uh, guide in an area, you become so unconfident as to what is actually out there. Even though you know the sound, you're like, is it? Is it ready? But definitely on the bucket list is to definitely go out to Mashatu. I had a good friend, Carl, who went out and worked at Mashatu. And he was there for a, a good few years. I mean, five years or so. So he must have had a really, really fantastic time out there. Okay, let's move along. So even though I mentioned that it's a semi-arid environment, which means it's quite sparse, does not mean that animals don't occur there. And as far as I've seen, uh, according to my research, there's at least 350 species of birds that occur in Mashatu alone. And 53 different mammal species, which is fantastic. That's a lot. We also have large reptile species like crocodiles and monitor lizards. And then also somewhere in the Mashatu they did find um, dinosaur footprints. Can you imagine going out to see dinosaur footprints? And they estimated it to be between 50 and 100 million years old, those footprints. Okay, it's very nice lighting at the moment. Okay, let's link you back to Ben. Let's head off to him. I believe he's out and about on the scout. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, not a lot has changed. I've moved on from Bofelsuk Dam. You can probably see still on the screen there the, the color of the sky is really rather spectacular. But we have expanded our search it's time to start looking for that last minute leopard. Uh, no idea where to even start looking, so I'm just going to slowly make my way down towards Twin Dams. We did have some tracks in the area sort of between Twin Dams and Treehouse Pan. Uh, this morning, for somebody, uh, we are, we're not sure who it was, a female leopard, so I figure we'll drive around and it's about time to lumber popped out and said, greetings, be nice. It has been quite a quiet afternoon this afternoon. Beautiful, but quiet in terms of animals. Beginning to keep my eyes open for chameleons now as well. The weather is so unusual. The fact that I had Birchall's Kukul's calling this morning, which is normally very much associated with summer, and I never thought it that this, whatever we are of August, first week of August, I'd be still driving around in a t-shirt short sleeve shirt at this time. Amanda, I hope you are correct. Um, let's all put our positive mental attitude hats on and just sort of repeat under your under your breath, just leopard, 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 leopard. Let's see what we get. I was saying to a bot earlier, I'm long overdue a leopard. Bush gods have not been kind to me over the last few days. Uh, but Perhaps tonight is the night. And say, so, I still enjoy the excitement of, of hoping. The simple fact that around every corner could be another one. And if nothing else, you guys should know by now, I am quite happy as long as there's even a few gaps in the clouds. I'm quite happy after dark, sitting, looking up. I'll try and figure out a way to show you another constellation uh, before we end the show. I think I mentioned, um, oh, there's a little owl. Where did you go? Sorry, Impoff, I'm blinding you. There's a little owl, he just flew off this little post next to us. Pearl spotted, I expect. Sorry, everyone, I got distracted. Just want to see if we can see where the owl went. It may have gone straight through. You can hear the other birds 
making a fire. Ah, there he is. It went the other way. Oh, that's the other one of the pair. Can you can you get him from there, Paul? He's being mobbed by the Drongo. Yeah, there we go. The Forktail Drongo dive bombing him. Yeah, it's my first owl this week. Let's just make sure it's very likely to be a pearl spotted owlet. But let me just double check. So we also get barred owl here. Difficult to see. He's got his back to us. I'm just going to shine the lights. We don't normally shine lights on owls, but he's got his back to us, so it shouldn't be a problem. I'm just going to try and get a look at the markings. I think that's a barred owlet. Pearl spotted owl has got two sort of dots on the back of his head, which is a sort of an anti predation thing where uh, potentially something sneaking up behind it, it thinks that there are eyes there. Uh, but then he flew off, uh, but I'm pretty sure that was a, a barred owlet, which is very nice to see. I'll mean, just see if he flew up the road anyway, otherwise I'll show you a picture quickly in the book. Very nice to see, African barred owlet. Did he land somewhere over here? that there's nothing worse than just as your favorite leopard is about to catch his first meal in three days. You are on the edge of your seat and up pops an advert. But we want to let you know that we hear you. You can watch Wild Earth without the ads. Sign up to be an explorer and watch the channel on the Wild Earth website completely ad free. Head over to our explorer page to find out more. So you can see just here, that's the pearl spotted owl's back of his head. So it looks like he's got two eyes on the back of his head uh, to scare away any potential predators creeping up behind him. Uh, but we could clearly see these two sort of white wing bars uh, and I couldn't see those two dots on the back of the head. And I can hear the barred owl calling, kind of makes a grrr, grrr. Noise, lovely little, lovely noise. But that was nice, barred outlet. Hopefully that's a good start. Uh, anyway, so what I was saying was that we'll try and do another constellation. I think we'll try and do the constellation of Centaurus tonight because we were talking about the pointer stars of the Southern Cross yesterday and they're often mistaken um, to be a part of the Southern Cross but they are in Centaurus. Cindy D, that's a very loaded question. Uh, stars can be bright or dim for a whole variety of reasons. Um, the first thing, that, or the most important thing to consider is how far away a star is, because don't forget a star that is really bright, but if it's thousands of light years away, it's going to look quite dim to us just because the, it, it's so far away, whereas a relatively dim star that's close to us will look bright. Uh, for example, take this spotlight. If I was standing three meters in front of you, shining it in your face, uh, it would be very uncomfortable and very bright. But if I was 200 meters away shining it at you, uh, it wouldn't be so bright at all. So distance is probably the most important thing. And the other is, is size and how hot the star burns. Generally, uh, the, the hotter the star burns, the brighter it is. Uh, but its size will also play a role. So take one of the, the super giant stars like Betelgeuse or Antares which you may have heard of, those are the big red stars in Orion and uh, Scorpio respectively. They actually are quite cool stars because red, orange is a cool colour in space, whereas blue and white is a hot colour. Think like a Bunsen burner at school or a, a welding torch. When it's red or orange, it's on its lowest setting and when you want to use it, you sort of crank it up and it goes that bluish colour. Uh, but those super giant stars are so large that they still give off a lot of light, even though they're not particularly bright. So it's all a matter of surface area. 
Um, so lots and lots of different factors, but the most important one is distance. And certainly for astronomers who are trying to understand the different properties of stars, how bright they are, uh, what they're made out of, what elements are contained within them, the first thing they have to do is establish the distance to the star. Because until you know that, it's very difficult to know for sure what you're looking at. Once you know the distance, you can start comparing it. Um, Ryan, no, not necessarily. I mean, there are lots of, there are 88 constellations in the sky. And remember that the Greeks could only see those in the northern hemisphere. So there's a bunch of constellations in the southern hemisphere that the Greeks didn't even know about. And they were only added to the, to the catalogue, if you like, uh, in the 15, 1600s. And then some more were added in the 1700s. Some of them even actually from here in South Africa by a French astronomer, astronomer whose name is Nicolas de Lacaille. He had an observatory at the base of Table Mountain. And one constellation that he added in around the 1750s is actually called Mensa, which means table in Latin, and it's named after Table Mountain um, from Cape Town. So even actually South Africa has a constellation kind of named after one of its landmarks, which is quite a claim to fame. But um, every um, culture has its own mythology for the stars. And so it's not just the Greeks, just most people know the Greek mythology because it's written down and it's taught in some schools to some extent and it's very well known and well documented. But there's no right or wrong. Every culture has its own mythology. The Romans had their own mythology. The, the Bushmen, the Zulu, the Corsa, the, the Songa people, they've all got their own stories. Hindu mythology, Egyptian mythology. They do tend to use the same shapes of stars, although Eastern uh, astronomy, Eastern constellations of China, Japan, they are very, very different. But most cultures use the same basic shapes of the stars, but the stories behind them differ depending on where you are. It's just that the Greek constellations are the most commonly known uh, and most well documented. The nice thing is if you start understanding Greek mythologies, there are so many constellations that are actually linked to each other and it becomes like a big storyboard. Um, for example, Centaurus, which I'll show you uh, with some software in a little bit. Um, we can link that to five or six or seven different other constellations in the sky because of the stories associated with that character. So yeah, it very much depends on, on your culture. And there, remember there's no rule that a constellation has to look like something. A lot of people are very surprised. You say, oh, this is Libra the scales, and they're like, well, it looks like a triangle. But that doesn't really matter. It's, uh, there's no rule that says you have to draw lines through certain stars to make certain shapes. An area of sky is a constellation, and to be honest, whatever you see in there is fine. As long as you point at the right area of sky and give it the correct name, you, you can't be wrong. So if you think about the Southern Cross last night, uh, the Greeks, for example, since you mentioned them, uh, the Greeks didn't even recognize the Southern Cross as a constellation, even though they could see it. They considered it a part of Centaurus, which we will cover a little bit later, whereas we talked about some of the Bushman stories about the Southern Cross. I think that's a very interesting part of it for me, the way that um, so many cultures see so many different things. Remember the, the night sky is like a storyboard, people sitting around a fire, they're looking up, they're, they see a shape in the sky and then they attribute some memory or some religious significance to it and so the story grows and is embellished by future generations as it's passed on. That'd be a good look around Twin Dams, we're down here at the moment, but nothing as of yet. Oh, I see some eyes in the drainage line. Something small down there, and I don't know, I think it's going to be a bit far away for your camera. I think it's gone now, it looks. If it was something small, it may be a genet or something, but I can't see the eyes anymore. Maybe let's try a bit further up. 
scrub hair. I think if we get to the damn wall, if you guys are still with me, then I will try and show you that um, constellation on a on some software that I've got with me. It's very difficult for us to frame the stars. Hello, Ella, 10 years old. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, yeah, there's quite a few animals that do use the stars to help them navigate. A lot of birds have been shown to uh, know which direction to fly, particularly uh, when it's time to migrate by looking at the movement of the sky. Because don't forget, the sky moves throughout the course of the night. Um, and when it does so, that's because, of course, the Earth is turning, not because the sky is turning. Don't forget that. Where's my tablet gone? Where is my tablet? That's a good question. Um, sorry, Ella, and uh, there are some seals that have been... Oh, there it is. Some seals that have been shown uh, to use the stars to navigate. And, of course, the most famous example out here in the African bush is that of the dung beetle. And dung beetles have been shown to use the Milky Way, the line of stars that, uh, that sort of gives you that white stripe across the sky, if you've ever seen very dark skies. Uh, they will use that, just like they use the sun and the moon to uh, to help them navigate when they're around. If they're not around, that line of stars can also be used. Right, just give me a second here, guys. I'm just getting everything set up. I've got a, a couple of pictures I want to show you as well in a book. Just find the right pages and then I'll be with you. But thank you, Ella, for those. And I'm sure there's other things as well, but a lot of insects as well use the light of the moon. That is why... Um, uh, you know, when you've got your outside lights on and light pollution messes with the insects as well. Okay, let me show you the constellation of Centaurus. So we looked... I have to ah, do you have to go back to colour? So well, let us just figure out our, our cameras to, to make this work. Give us a couple of secs. Okay, there we go. Oh, look at the colours behind me, lovely. So there's the Southern Cross that we were looking at last night and the two pointer stars here, Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri. And these apps are great that you can use. And the Greeks saw it as a part of this much larger constellation, which is called Centaurus. Oops, he's flipping, flicking around. So Centaurus is a half man, half horse. And in Greek mythology, generally, centaurs were considered to be rather brutal creatures. They, they weren't uh, very intelligent, they were, they were quite savage, they were vicious hunters, and not very nice people at all, to be honest. <clears throat> but the one was different, and this, this is uh, a centaur called Chiron. Now, Chiron is actually a half-brother to Zeus, so he was, the father, he was fathered by Saturn, or um, Cro Krotos, depending on, Kronos, sorry, depending on which uh, mythology, whether you're going Greek or Roman. And he was a very educated centaur, and he was very involved in educating a lot of the great Greek heroes that you might have heard of. So people like Achilles and Jason and Asclepius, who was a god of medicine, Castor, Pollux, Hercules, they were all educated by uh, Chiron. And Chiron was immortal because he was a son of, um, of Saturn. Unfortunately, he accidentally got shot by one of Hercules' poisoned arrows, and being immortal, he was uh, resigned to an eternity of suffering. And then Zeus, because of all the good work that Chiron had done for the other gods, took pity of him, on him and removed his immortality and placed him up into the stars uh, to honour this, this great achievement that he had made. Now, if any of you know where Centaurus is, or just to help you, you can see the Southern Cross. Let me just show you where the Southern Cross is again. Oops, there we go. There's the Southern Cross. And you can see the two pointer stars here. They're usually quite easy to find in the sky. And there's a really, really, really interesting object that you can even see with binoculars in Centaurus. So it's called Omega Centauri. And you can see it's this little blob here. So the easiest way to find it is if you can find the Southern Cross, and then if you draw a line through these two stars of the Southern Cross, it'll take you straight to it. And you can just see it with your naked eye. Uh, it's like a looks like a very very faint star, but you'll know it if you get your binoculars on it because it looks like a fuzzy patch in the sky. I always describe it as like a fuzzy golf ball. It looks like a, a little cloud up in the sky. Now, when you do find that, that's what we call a globular cluster, which is a bit of a fancy name, uh, but that means it's a great big ball of stars. 
Uh, and I want to show you a photograph of it that was taken by, I think it was the Hubble or one of the European space, space agencies. Hopefully you can see it there. If, and Paul, you can zoom in. Uh, you should be able to see just how many stars, look at that, how many stars actually clustered in that area of sky. Uh, and there are thought to be in excess of 10 million stars all in that one little piece that you can see in your binoculars. And right in the middle here, we think is an intermediate-sized black hole. Now, what makes this object even more special is there are other what we call globular clusters in the sky, but this is the biggest and brightest of the lot of them. And what we actually believe this object to be is actually the core of a baby galaxy that our Milky Way ate at some point during our past. So remember, space is all about gravity. Big things attract little things. Our Milky Way galaxy is quite large. And at some point, a smaller galaxy got too close to us. We sucked it into us because of our gravity and absorbed it into our own, basically. So we kind of cannibalized it. And this is what is left behind, which is the core of an alien galaxy. So that's a very cool object that you can see with the naked eye. And through binoculars, you'll see that sort of hazy patch. And through a backyard telescope, you'll start to see that there are lots and lots and lots of individual stars. And then just to blow your mind a little bit, uh, this object is a long way away. It's 17,000 light years away. Now, if you remember yesterday, we had a brief chat about it. One light year is about 10 trillion kilometers. So if you can do 10 trillion times 17,000, that's how many kilometers away this object is, which means that when you look at it, you're looking at the past because it's going to take 17,000 years for the light to travel from that to your eyes. So when you look at it through your binoculars, you're not seeing what it looks like today. You're seeing what it looked like 17,000 years ago. So that hurts your head a little bit. Try and wrap your head about that. So what it looks like today, we won't know. We'll have to wait 17,000 years to find out because it'll take that long for the light to travel all that way uh, from its source to our eyes on Earth. So that's one thing about space. It really blows your mind when you start to think about it. But yeah, so that's the constellation of uh, Centaurus. And I said there's lots of other constellations linked to it. Uh, Hercules, so whose arrow unfortunately uh, brought about the, the death of uh, Chiron. He's a constellation up in the sky, also linked with the constellation of Aquila, the eagle, Castor and Pollux I mentioned, which is part of the constellation of Gemini. Uh, there are lots of other links that we can make, even, say, Jason from Jason of the Argonauts, his ship, the Argo Navis, is up there in the sky as well. So really, really fascinating uh, stuff up there. So I encourage all of you to, to go and do some reading and look up at the night sky if you can tonight. Look for the Southern Cross um, and then look at that area of stars around it and see if you can find Omega Centauri. If anybody can, I'd love to hear from you, even if it's tomorrow. All right, let's carry on and see if we can do this last minute leopard thing. So I started watching Wild Earth at the beginning of COVID and I haven't looked back since. I've seen all of the leopards I wanted to see in Marives. He's been so playful and such a character. I had to remind myself to breathe at some points. <laughs> to see those two cubs made me very emotional. It's just been brilliant. It's just blown me away. Frey, you're very welcome. I, I hope you're enjoying them. It's it's always difficult to to try. Thank you for that. It's always difficult to uh, uh, to sort of show you the stars without showing them to you. But at least I've got an app with me now that I can give you a vague idea um, of the outline and uh, try and give you some of those quick stories. But we're going to try and do something astronomical each night that I'm out. Um, and yeah, tomorrow night we'll cover another one. But yeah, see if you can find 
uh, the constellation of Centaurus. So go out there, look for the two pointers, which are those very, very bright stars close to the Southern Cross. And then, so there are many free apps that you can use that will help you sort of trace out the outline of those constellations. And then use the Southern Cross to try and find that Omega Centauri, because that's a really special object to see. To think that you might actually be looking at the core of an alien galaxy, I think is, is pretty mind-blowing. And if you've got really good eyes with your binoculars, have a look around that area after you've found Omega Centauri. And there's another little cloudy patch quite close by, which is actually another galaxy itself. Uh, the Centaurus A galaxy is the fifth brightest galaxy in the sky, but don't get excited, that still means it's quite faint. But you can pick it up in binoculars as a little cloudy patch. Now that is about 15 million light years away. So wrap your head around that one. Okay, before I send you all to sleep with uh, astronomical facts and figures, uh, I'm going to keep looking for my leopard and let's send you back across to Andrew. So much yet unknown out there. Okay, so we're getting some rose colors in the horizon. Of course, we are still with the sunset. Lighting is quite bad at the moment, so I think uh, this is our best bet, is just to watch Africa going down to sleep. So for all this, the fellow South Africans that are watching, and also for anybody else who's planning on traveling to, to Africa, um, it's very interesting if you watch the sun go down because of our position to the equator the sun does go down extremely fast so roughly it's about two and a half minutes from the moment it touches the horizon until it's underneath and same with rising and you can actually see it um, going down and coming up in the morning it's very very quick um, hence the reason why we don't get any twilight which is prolonged night light at night because of the slow descent or rise of the, the sun we don't get that sun goes down quickly sun rises quickly and before you know it, so when the sun starts to go down and it's down the horizon, it gets pitch dark very, very quickly. And then also in the mornings, it gets light very quickly. So it's all in relation to your position to the equator. The closer you are to the equator, uh, the faster the sun sets and sun rises but the further apart you are or further away you are from the equator uh, it's going to be the very slow process going down and coming up again Beautiful. Sorry about those glitches. Not sure if you're seeing them, but if you are, we apologize. Okay, I believe Mashatu has got bat fox, which is interesting. I know Ukukuyo does. And in fact, And then also, in fact, in the Eastern Cape, where Lauren is, I know they see bat fox from time to time. And Cape fox as well from time to time. Depends how arid it is. If it's a prolonged drought and becomes semi-arid, uh, like it has been for the last few years. It's green now, but it's, oh, they've just come out of a very nasty drought. And, and still are in one, actually. Uh, bat foxes, meerkats have been seen. But as soon as the rainfall comes back and things start to stabilize again, those semi-arid animals will start moving north again. Now it's interesting if you look at the dist distribution for animals like meerkats and bat fox, they say the further southern belt, belt for them would be at Addo National Park. That's what the books say. But here I am telling you that Amakala does see bat fox from time to time. So it definitely goes to show that animals will always adapt and make up their own rules as they go along. You can only predict to a degree.
But yeah, I would love to see Battered Fox. I believe they have been seen at Mashatu um, in this pan as well, or, or drinking from this pan. So you never know in future future times, we just might get lucky. Alright, we'll just continue watching this beautiful sunset. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back to Cedric. Yes, nice to see a beautiful sunset there with uh, Andrew. Yeah, well, I am back. I am still alive. Unfortunately, I have had a couple of uh, uh, windy glitches for the afternoon. So um, yes, I have been uh, on and off for the for the sunset drive. But so far, looks like Wendy might behave for the last couple of minutes, which is nice. At least I can say hello to everybody, and uh, I am still around. But yeah, I am on quarantine at the moment. We did have buffaloes crossing into Biffleswick uh, area. And uh, we had lions calling as well. And that's from Gallego Shortcut. Uh, Gallego Shortcut straight into Biffleswick, exactly where those buffaloes were heading. Those lions were just calling just north of the cut line. And I'm sure it must be the Telemati uh, breakaways and the uh, S8 mail. So, Maybe those buffaloes will decide all of a sudden to turn around and come back to Juma. And hopefully if they do that, maybe they bring the Telemartis, uh, breakaways and the S8 mail uh, down south again, which will be fantastic. But yes, I am uh, on quarantine open at the moment. Just taking a look, see if I can pick up on anything interesting this side. Uh, there's a couple, oh wait, hold on, I think I do see something. Uh, let's just see what I've got here. Let's see what I've got here. Oh, there's something that's sitting in the grass there. I want to see what, I don't even know. So I don't have a monitor, so I'm not too sure. Oh, it's going, oh, it's a little white-tailed mongoose. Oh, he's running off. Oh, white-tailed mongoose. Bye-bye. Yeah, always on these open clearings, but, uh, we got him there, uh, Adi. Ah, uh, it's difficult, sorry. I think he's just, he was sitting there and he just decided to move off. There's a great proverb that has been passed down from generation to generation across the plains of Africa. Until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Join Wild Earth for a special lion safari on the 10th of August, broadcast to you live in celebration of World Lion Day. Witness the pride and joy of Juma, the Nkumas, the Talamatis, and the Avoka males who come roaring to your screens to tell you their story. Here on Wild Earth, we love it when you interact with our guides while they are live. In order to do this, you must head over to wildearth.tv forward slash questions and submit your questions, comments and suggestions. Simple as that. And to make it even simpler, from time to time you will see a QR code on your screen. Open your camera phone and scan this code and it will take you straight to where you need to be. We look forward to answering your questions on this channel. Yeah, so I'm gonna just continue with the uh, uh, quarantine. I'm just gonna do a little block around the open clearing. Maybe we are lucky to bump into that little white-tailed mongoose once again. Uh, we shall just take a look and keep our uh, lights on there. Yeah, I can see him again, but it's a little bit far now. I was hoping he was gonna come here, but I think he's a little bit shy. You know, I think he doesn't want to come closer to us. So I'll just leave him. Oh, eyes are quite far from us here. Yeah. 
Oh, I hope everybody had a fantastic uh, sunset drive this afternoon. There has been some interesting things happening around, as always. Uh, well, we're going to continue with our quarantine. We are going to head back to, I'm not too sure who, but uh, I didn't co copy final control there, so we are heading back to one of the other, other one, so I'm not too sure who. Thanks, Cedric. Uh, yeah, I've just come out onto Filament's cut line. We've got a little steer box hiding off to the right there. I did just get a very brief visual of a hyena. I'm afraid we weren't able to see who it was. It disappeared very, very quickly. Um, and I noticed somebody asked a question about Swazi earlier. Um, and I was telling you what happened to Indebele and didn't realise. So if you were asking about Swazi specifically, my apologies. Um, of course, it was Indebele that had her, those injuries that we saw. Uh, I thought it might have been Swazi that we saw. We just saw the down there on elephant carcass headed towards that uh, other den site. Here we can actually hear the toads calling, it's eastern olive toads calling in the background, which is something very much associated with summer, not first week of August. <laughs> you see an eye sticking out there. All right, let's see if we've got about a minute left to find you, this leopard. I was actually thinking about um, that Omega Centauri I was telling you about. You know, one of the closest stars to Earth, which is called Captain Star, it's only about 12 light years away, say only. Um, but that star, we actually think, came from that object in the sky. So one of the closest stars to Earth is quite literally an alien star that came from a galaxy far, far away from us. It's all rather Star Wars-y. Uh, we've even found an exoplanet, so a, a planet orbiting that star. So that really is the definition of an alien planet. But I love this stuff. I find it fascinating. Anyway, we are almost out of time. Um, I think we've just hit, come into the last minute, so I'm afraid it doesn't look like we're going to get any last minute spots for you. But I hope you've enjoyed the afternoon. We've had some, some nice sightings, some beautiful sunset. And of course, myself, Cedric, and I'm sure the rest of the team will be out with you tomorrow morning for a lovely Sunday drive. Um, but as always, we wish you a fabulous evening wherever you are, and uh, we hope that we will, you will join us tomorrow.